Oh, okay. These are the extras, and then the ones at the bottom, I'll leave you pens. Button now. I will step out during your okay, executive thank session. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mary. Do you know if there's any bottled water floating around? Anyway, do you have any upstairs? I know grill. Right, we're on. Water oh, what? Poured. Did you? Poured. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, there you go. Welcome to the board and the meeting of the Army Select Board of April 9th, 2024. Um, this is a hybrid meeting which requires that the following notice be read into the record. This is to formally advise that as required by General Laws Chapter 38, Sections 18 through 25, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 18, 2021 as extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. The Armist Select Board will hold a public meeting on Tuesday, April 9th, 2024 at 5.50 p.m., beginning with executive session and then opening to the public no sooner than 6 p.m. Could be a little later than that. Uh, in the hearing room, Yarmouth Town Hall, 1146, Route 28, South Yarmouth, 02664. The public is welcome to attend either in person or via the alternative public access provided below. And what is below the notice is the public access um, for getting on with a computer or by telephone, which you can go to the Yarmouth website for that. Um, I'll entertain at this point a motion to go into executive session to, to consider entering um, pursuant to Chapter 38, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation involving Blue Sky Towers. Is that Roman number three, I guess, LLC, 1044, Route 28, South Yarmouth. Do I have such a motion? So moved. I have a second. Okay. All those in favor, we'll do a roll call, Mark. Um, I vote I with the understanding that doing so in public would be contrary to the, uh, to the best interest of the town and litigation. Okay. strategy for the town. I think that's a determination we have to affirm. And, and the board so finds. Very good. And, and, and Dan? Aye. And I vote aye. And Dorcas? Aye. <coughs> aye. Okay. So we have a unanimous vote by roll call to go into executive services, uh, executive session for those purposes and for reasons that Mark articulated uh, and, and I made findings on as well. We are in executive session. Good evening. Welcome to the public portion of the Select Board meeting, the Army Select Board of April 9th, 2024. We begin our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, do we have any announcements? Announcements, I don't see any. I'm going to skip over public comment just quickly and go to the next item. We have a lot of uh, fire folks here tonight to recognize new hires and promotions and also to recognize those who have served on the department uh, but have retired um, during during um, this, this year and the last year, I guess it was. So first of all, we'll recognize the, our fire chief, Enrique Arascu, who will tell us about the new hires and promotions within the Army Fire Department. Hello. Thank you. I appreciate you taking us out of order. Just wanted to get these in before uh, these guys have to go on another call. So I'm going to start with uh, the new hires uh, for this uh, since the last time we were here. Um, and some of them, uh, a couple aren't here, so I apologize. Uh, but I'd like to introduce you to uh, at least four of them here. Uh, Derek Lampier is a firefighter EMT. He was hired on November 20th of 2023. Derek comes to us from uh, Cape Cod Healthcare. Uh, and is currently in his last week of the Mass Fire Academy and will graduate Friday. Uh, we'll have him back. Come on up, Derek. Uh, yeah, just, you can, uh, 
Uh, let me just hang there until okay. we'll, we'll get everybody up here at the same time. Um, Jacob Sullivan couldn't be here with us. Um, he is also at the Mass Fire Academy, actually in the, the Stowe campus. He was graduated, uh, I apologize, he was hired also on November 20th of 2023, and he'll graduate on May 10th uh, and be back on shift at that point. Uh, Christopher Sharp is not with us. He's a firefighter EMT. He was hired uh, in December of 2023. Uh, Christopher came for us from Brewster EMS and the Onset Call Fire Department. Uh, he'll be attending the um, uh, Mass Fire Academy next, starting uh, in April. Christopher Sheedy uh, is a firefighter EMT. He was hired on uh, February 26, 2024. Christopher comes to us from the East Manatee Fire Rescue uh, Department in Bradenton, Florida. Uh, he began in the fire service in 2015. And Christy Whitaker is our newest fire alarm operator. She was hired in November 21st of 2023. Uh, and she came to us from the Sandwich Police Department dispatch. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Mary Maslowski, town clerk. I'd just like to uh, officially swear in our new uh, fire staff. If you would raise your right hand and repeat after me, you'll state your name. You will also state at the appropriate time what your position is with the, with the town being that you're um, different. And then once you're done, you can sign each of those three papers. You'll take the one in the green. So please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, I do solemnly swear and affirm that I will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon me as a for the town of Yarmouth according to the charter bylaws rules and regulations of the town of Yarmouth, the constitution and laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the constitution and laws of the United States of America. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank God. My knees nice. couldn't take it. Nice. Yeah, bean cheeks, man. Yeah. Make the rounds. You got Thank it. You so much. Have to Thank run you. the gauntlet here. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. Make your rounds. Eric. Eric. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank Chris, welcome. Thank you so Thank you. much. Congratulations. Welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. No, you're not my way. Congratulations. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. It's all yours. Thank you. Well, I guess, much. Chief, we're going to proceed to some retirement recognitions. Yes, sir. Uh, unfortunately, they've all kind of moved on on us already, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll at least mention them. I did give some of these comments. We had a uh, very nice ceremony for, uh, for Deputy Sawyer and Captain Huck last week uh, at Station 3, so thank you all uh, that could attend. Uh, Deputy Sawyer uh, started with the department in July of 1997. Uh, before he came to us, he was an active duty for the United States Air Force and crew chief uh, on the rescue from uh, July of 82 to May of 92, uh, briefly working at Westover and Otis Air Force bases as a firefighter before accepting a position at the Yarmouth Fire Department. Deputy Sawyer became a lieutenant in February of 20 2007 and soon after took on the role of lieutenant inspector. He was promoted to captain inspector of March of 2011. After serving as acting deputy beginning of 20, uh, 2013, he was officially promoted to deputy fire chief on September 11th of 2015. Deputy Sawyer has contributed to the department through his vast knowledge of grant writing, 
and successfully secured millions of dollars of grants for safety equipment, training, staffing, as well as apparatus. So congratulations to Deputy Sawyer. Uh, Captain Inspector Kevin Huck, uh, he came to us from Alaska in 1995. He worked as a commercial fisherman in Kodiak from uh, January of 84 to January of 94. He went on to work for the Kodiak Fire Department until June of 1995. After obtaining his paramedic license, he began with the Yarmouth Fire Department on July of 1997. He was then promoted to lieutenant in November of 2010 and to captain in July of 2016. Captain Huck has been working as a fire prevention officer where he's, uh, he has been dedicated to the town uh, in all areas, especially education of the public and preventing loss of property and life throughout his many years of service. Thank you to Captain Huck. Uh, and in February, we also lost uh, firefighter paramedic Ray Bombardier. He uh, worked for the town of Yarmouth for 28 years. He was a dedicated member of the department and also had served his country prior as a Marine prior to working here with the town. So thank you to Ray. The board, the board thanks you for that. And we have um, citations that um, we would like to issue to these three um, retirees from the Yarmouth Fire Department in recognition of their uh, many, many years of service, faithful service to the town. First one's to Jonathan Sawyer on his retirement as Deputy Fire Chief, effective March 27th of 2024, and for dedicated service to the town. And it says, and be it further known that the town of Yarmouth extends its sincerest thanks and appreciation for over 26 and a half years of tireless service in the Yarmouth Fire Department. This citation is duly signed by the chair of the Yarmouth Select Board on behalf of all of its individual members on the ninth day of April in the year of our Lord, 2024. And I signed it on behalf of my colleagues in the board that was, that's for Deputy Chief Sawyer. And then we have a similar citation for Kevin Huck on his retirement as captain, effective March 30th, 2024, and for dedicated service to the town of Yarmouth. And the citation continues on and says, and be it further known, that the town of Yarmouth extends its sincerest thanks and appreciation for over 26 and a half years of tireless service in the Yarmouth Fire Department. This citation is duly signed by the Chair of the Yarmouth Select Board on behalf of each of its individual members on this ninth day of April in the year of our Lord, 2024. That's in recognition of Captain Kevin Huck. And thirdly, we have a similar citation to Raymond M. Bombardier on his retirement as firefighter EMT paramedic effective February 29th, 2024, and for dedicated service to the town of Yarmouth. <coughs> Excuse me. And the citation reads, and be it further known, that the town of Yarmouth extends its sincerest thanks and appreciation for over 27 years. See, he broke the tip. They were all 26 and a half. <laughs> we saved a good guy for the last 27 years of title service in the Yarmouth Fire Department. This citation is being duly signed by the Chair of the Yarmouth Select Board on behalf of each of its individual members on this ninth day of April in the year of our Lord, 2024. And I've signed that as well. So make sure that they get these and that they, the message gets conveyed to them that the Board thanks them most sincerely for all that they've done for the town and for the longevity of their careers. Thank you, sir. I also, oh, sorry, go ahead. While we're here, I just wanted to also mention that uh, due to these retirements and, and others, uh, we've currently made some acting positions at the department. I just were worth mentioning at this point. Uh, acting Deputy Walsh, uh, he was a ca he's been a captain uh, with the Yarmouth Fire Department since 2010, 30-year <coughs> veteran of the department. Uh, we also uh, have made Acting Captain Kitla, who has had uh, many stints in that role and has always been very successful. Uh, and 
Lieutenant, uh, Acting Lieutenant Brian Grawl, who's getting an opportunity to serve in that capacity. So I just wanted to mention that to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's always good to hear from the folks at the Armored Fire Department, and um, I know I speak for the board when I tell you we have our deepest appreciation for all the fine work that you do. And we're aware of it, and um, we're happy to have all of you on the department. So we're going to back up to public comment, I guess. Anybody have public comment? Joyce. Thank you. Uh, this announcement is being read at all the towns on the Cape and the Vineyard from the Cape Light Compact. Um, the Cape Light Compact has uh, made a change in its program for nonprofits, and it's a change that might particularly affect a lot of nonprofits and churches in the town of Yarmouth. Um, essentially, the compact is offering incentives covering up to 100 percent of the cost of recommended upgrades for qualified nonprofit organizations. This includes en enhanced incentives to decarbonize the building, such as weatherization and heat pumps. And if you have looked at heat pumps, you know incentivizing heat pumps, that's a big chunk of money. Um, if organizations were not eligible in the past, they may now be eligible. Here are the requirements um, in terms of the organization, organization's energy effort. They have to have received an energy assessment. Um, concerning their headquarters, uh, the nonprofit must own the building or have a long-term lease. Um, type and age, um, they can only be a 501c3 or house of worship, and they have to have been in operation for at least five years. Um, there's an upward limit on their electric consumption. They have to have an an annual electric usage for all accounts on the site, not exceeding 1.5 million kilowatt hours in the prior 12 months. And the active commercial electric account must be in the nonprofit's name as opposed to, say, a landlord's name. So these enhanced incentives are available, but here's the thing that might eliminate a few organizations. Um, they're only available for buildings that heat with electric, oil, and propane. If you heat with natural gas and you're an eligible nonprofit, you go knock on the door of National Grid, according to the Department of Public Utilities Division of Responsibilities. Um, the details about this are all online. There's no application deadline. It's one of those ongoing programs. And the Cape Light Compact uh, staff member who will be in charge of this is Meredith Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Carolyn. Thank you. Um, I just set my timer. My name's Carolyn Burnett. I could stay here all day and talk to you, chit chat with you. Um, but I wanted to come this evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I am here to represent a group um, that is composed of multiple towns. Um, our mission is to build an aquatic facility uh, in the mid to lower Cape region. Uh, we are a nonprofit. And um, if you care to learn more about this particular uh, group, it's Upstream Aquatics. Um, but I'm not here to ask that this evening. I'm here um, first just to acknowledge uh, our town administrator. I have met with you. I've heard loud and clear the town absolutely does not have municipal funds for the idea of an aquatic facility. I've spent most of the fall kind of pounding the pavement, um, and, and I have heard you loud and clear. Um, however, uh, we have the opportunity, I think, as a town, um, it's a very recently submitted ballot question um, that has been submitted to the clerk to possibly be on the ballot, um, simply asking the question of our citizens, a non-binding question, would you support the building of an aquatic facility? Um, I'm at 1.30. <laughs> 29 seconds, I'm going to wrap up. Um, 
I think that Yarmouth has the opportunity to be a leader for the rest of the towns, the rest of the municipalities, which are eagerly interested in pursuing this, this vision. Um, we could point to be a leader of, let's just ask the town this question. Let's take the temperature on what our residents think. Um, I think we have an obligation to take action and participate in, in simply asking our residents this question. Um, the whole board, I know at least a couple of you personally have definitely supported the recreation efforts in our town and um, I'm over now. That's 225. Um, I know that, that you care deeply about the recreation, but I, I guess it just doesn't end in this town. It ends in our community. So I'm asking Yarmouth if we could put this simply on the ballot, this question, which we would need your approval to do, which we would also need your approval to do before next Tuesday. I know it's a timing issue and it might not happen for this particular May 21st election. But if it doesn't happen for May 21st, it will definitely happen for the warrant, perhaps in the fall or maybe even next year. I think we're, we need to ask the question of Yarmouth so that we have a better pointed answer of, we don't have to spend any money on a feasibility study. Um, we could simply ask our residents this question and maybe have uh, a, a true sense of um, where we could move forward. Thank you. Could we have our town clerk come up, please? So, in terms of the, which, which, does anybody have this, is this in the specific question in here? Yes. What page? On the last page. The top where the signatures, right before the signatures. <laughs> So the long the, sheet. the very last page it's handwritten okay I see it it's it's handwritten all right would you support the building of an aquatic facility in the mid to lower Cape region um, obviously very very broad and we'll talk about that in, in a minute but if this were to go uh, on the Next ballot with the with the uh, override question, which I anticipate will probably vote on the same thing. Be on the ballot after town meeting. When would when would a decision have to be made on that to get it on with the school override question? So, when would the board actually have to say yes or no? The board, based on your current schedule of public meetings, you would have to vote tonight. Tonight. To provide my office notice that you intend to put ballot questions on the ballot. It is 35 days in advance of the town meeting. That date is April 16th, Tuesday. So by the close of business, so 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday, April 16th, I have to receive notice that you intend to put a ballot question on the ballot. So for both the, for an override question or for this question, so if you, you choose to You have to know vote, tonight. You have to know tonight. Okay. So, and what, now, what will happen is tomorrow morning, I would simply ask that staff provide a, a letter. So the board doesn't want to assist, it's too much, too, too much of a rush. Mm -hmm. When is the next opportunity for it to go on? So the applicants can pull another request for a ballot question for the annual town ballot for next year. And based on the statute, when you if, say the ballot for next year, you mean the annual? Annual town, the annual town election. So they would be able to try again for next year. The way the statute is written is that if the board chooses not to act on a petition question and there is more than 90 days in advance of an election, a scheduled election, then the petitioners can seek 10% of the registered voters within the town of Yarmouth to force a ballot question on the ballot. So they Again, these are non-binding public advisory ballot questions. So they couldn't proceed with this, with what they've got for signatures? No, it would start, it would start the clock all over again. They'd have to get 
percent of registered voters? They would have to. How many so, registered voters do we have? I would say they would have to start the whole process over again if you don't vote it at this one because there is no, this was specifically for this town election. There's not 90 days, so they can't move forward on, the, on those. They would need to start new signatures again, provide another petition for the next annual town meeting if you choose not to vote on it and there is more than 90 days in advance, then they can okay. seek more signatures. When, when, did you, when, did you, when did you receive this stuff? I received that this afternoon. It, it was, it was uh, Ms. Burnett came and got papers maybe a week ago to pull okay. it out, so. All right, does anybody have any questions for Mary? No. Uh, the paperwork that is together with that letter does I know a little details. bit about the background of this because I've spoken to Carolyn directly last summer about it. Um, but if I had never seen this before, honestly, I'm not so sure I know what it meant. Would, would you support the building of an aquatic facility in the mid to lower Cape region? What's the mid to lower Cape region? Yarmouth to what? I would say that's the, a question for the petitioner. Well, we what are would you specifically be supporting? We are required. How big, on how big and how small and how much money, you know? Those are the questions I would have just if I had known nothing about it. And that's all the people would know. And I'm not, I'm not trying to advocate anything. I'm just I'm trying to get some issues out there if the board indeed has to make a decision tonight. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Ian? This is my first view of this. Um, first of all, let me say, Carolyn, I, I am always deeply appreciative of citizens uh, bringing uh, suggestions and um, ideas like this forward. Um, I did it myself one time. It's not easy. Um, and sometimes you face an awful lot of opposition. So I really appreciate the fact that you've done this. Um, I guess my, my main concern is just timing. It's, uh, it's too late in the game for us to be able to make any kind of knowledgeable recommendations to our population about what it is we're talking about, site, uh, costs, um, what other towns might be interested. It's just, it's a little bit too late, at least in my own opinion, to try to rush this and not give it the justice and the ample amount of information to the people of the town so that they can vote knowledgeably. Because it doesn't help you to put this on a ballot and have people say no simply because they don't know what we're talking about. That actually hurts you. Um, so I love the idea that you're doing this. Um, Frankly, I'm supportive of uh, a community swimming pool. I think it's a great idea. Um, but there's just a lot of intangibles at this point that need to be flushed out a little bit more before we can actually put this, at least in my estimation, in front of the voters so that they have a real opportunity to say yes or no to it. Um, so, you know, it would be my position that I'm not against it, but I just think it's too late in the game to try to push this out uh, without more. Mark. Um, it, as Dan said, I'm sort of in the same boat. I just received this, and I haven't even had a chance to go through any of this packet of material. I guess much of it has to do with the, um, the ballot procedures and requirements. Um, and so I'm getting this at first blush. I, I, I would agree with everything that Dan has said. Um, and just leave it at that. Dorcas. I also feel that this has come to us too late for us to, um, to go forward for this current election. I think that there needs to be some more consideration on this um, before we would go forward. Okay, uh, Peter. I think I think the way it's presented and the vagueness of the question, um, if it were on the ballot, would work against you. Uh, again, what is what is mid to lower Cape? Do you have any thoughts on location, cost? 
how many people it's going to serve, um, it, all, all those all those kind of questions. And and I know what you're just asking for is, would you be interested in it? Yeah, I think I think it's a great idea, but what does it mean? It's just it's too vague. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments very brief. I think you've used a word that is appropriate, is vague. And I think people, if they don't understand something, are going to be prone to vote no. Only because I don't know and I'm not voting for something I don't know anything about. That's, what, that's the way I would do it if, all, if this was all I knew about it. But like Dan. I admire a citizen initiative, and I like to see young people get involved in government and advocate for things that they want. Um, so I, I share that sentiment, and I don't want to de-incentivize you, but I think this thing's dead on arrival as, as a ballot question. I really do. Um, but that's, that's all. Let's hold, let's hold a vote until we reach that particular item. I'm pretty much convince what the board's going to do, but let's hold it so it's in its right place when we, we hit that ballot question. I think she did want an opportunity to speak to some of that, if, if you will. Well, she can hang around if you want to, With all respect. because we only have public comment right now, and I'm just kind of pulling the board because of the time sensitivity and because of the lack of specificity in the notice. Um, We'll get back to you. Hold your place, okay? All right. Anybody else on public comment? You got Vita on the screen. And Where's Vita? Vita Morris and Christopher Guerin also. Vita, would you like to be heard on public comment? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Even if we don't want to. Okay. I, I, I can't believe that. Uh, you know, the, the, no, I'm this kidding you, Vita. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I said I'm kidding you. Go ahead. Okay. No. Uh, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, make some comments uh, uh, relative to uh, what the uh, town seal committee uh, 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 presented to you a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, I was very surprised that. Uh, uh, they were uh, talking about what the state uh, uh, was considering doing uh, with their uh, seal and uh, what have you in, in various uh, forms. And uh, they forgot to mention that the, 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 that is a dead issue in the, uh, uh, in the state. Uh, as far as, in fact, somebody at, at one of the, the committee's meetings uh, uh, announced that uh, some time ago. That, that that's no longer uh, being even considered, and why they would be telling you that what the state was had been considering and or not, because it is now a dead issue. The other uh, thing that uh, uh, I was very surprised uh, uh, was that uh, uh, they had sought uh, opinions from the Native American uh, uh, leaders, I guess, or uh, uh, people in certain positions. And they finally managed to get a letter from Mr. David uh, Whedon. Uh, and as I told you, uh, uh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mr. Whedon uh, was his most uh, 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 pretty much, I mean, uh, really seriously opposed to the whole project and, and called it a historical erasure but by taking out the, uh, the uh, Native American figure from, from the uh, seal. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, he uh, also, this is a quote, so how do you uh, pay homage to those original people that are now gone in this new rendering of a seal? You know, this, this is, uh, and so they didn't particularly like that idea, I got the ideas that he was presenting, and were, I think are excellent comments. Um, and they went further, looking further, and they found uh, Mr. Whedon's young nephew, Brian Whedon, who was much more in line with their thinking, uh, by, uh, and I think that he used uh, his, a word inclusive, uh, uh, and, and that just, uh, you know, I, I don't understand what this whole project is about, how you can take something 
out of historical context and update it. It, it just makes no sense whatsoever. And, and uh, 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 this, this lady's proposal about the aquatic center reminded me that this, the, the whole thing with the seal, uh, when it came up from the very beginning, I would attend some of the meetings and I would say, please give us a, a, an idea of how much this is going to cost. And they waited and waited till the very last minute because I think sensing that it, it, it is going to be a very, rather expensive uh, proposition. Uh, and honestly, I, it's just uh, it, it's just amazing that they they have carried it as far as they did, uh, and for, you know, looking for, for getting some kind of approval from that. This was, of course, it was never uh, a uh, uh, something that the Native Americans had proposed doing, and to begin with, the, and 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 to carry it to, to this far and and push uh, and push uh, all the time. Uh, now, to, by ta uh, uh, just my own opinion, considering that the uh, the pilgrims uh, set foot here uh, on on the Cape, this area here, uh, I think to have and, and the people that they first met were the Native Americans, and to take that uh, image out of the seal, I think is is outrageous. And the, just to take everything out of context, for goodness sakes, out of historical context, and 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 update it. That's that's the word. I mean, honestly, uh, I just I sometimes feel as though uh, that famous uh, 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 painting of, of uh, Washington uh, crossing the Delaware is going to be uh, uh, somebody will come up with the idea to update that one if we're not careful. Thank you. Thank you, Vita. You say there's someone else. Christopher Guerin. Christopher. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear us okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, congratulations to the retiring five firefighters and to the new hires. Um, all the best to them in the future. Uh, second, on March 28th, the Yarmouth Zoning Board of Appeals denied Harborside Suite Motel's uh, appeal and found the motel in violation of the 30-day limited stay bylaw. Unfortunately, since then, the local media has not covered the story. So hopefully Mr. Rittenauer can provide us a status report, you know, based on publicly available information about what has happened since then and um, during the, you know, town administrator's update later uh, later on this, uh, this evening. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I can tell you, Christopher, that we did see, receive communication from the state. Um, official in charge of or, or involved in that uh, issue and also um, our town administrator got a call from the lieutenant governor and there is a, uh, a move out date that we have been given so we'll have a little something at the end on that on, okay. on the town administrator updates what well, I thank you for that and I also want to thank the select board for taking the, uh, using the judicial process, the proper way to, to, to address this. Uh, and, and I just want to thank you again. All right, thank Have you. Have a good evening. Okay, anyone else? Now, Brittany DiRienzo says, allowed to talk. Um, I'm not sure if she has a public comment. I, oh, is it? I've never seen that. But maybe we could elevate Brittany and see if she wanted to talk later or now. It's, it's just a highlight on the screen. You can just Okay. Yeah. That's a disregard. Thanks for public comment. I've just never seen that tab before. All right, let's then go on um, to approve and approve, review and approve ballot questions. We talked about um, Carolyn Warner's ballot question. I noticed she has absented herself. I don't know if that's temporary or not. Um, but I think the board has clearly indicated that they will not support putting that on the ballot this year with the school override question, correct? Yes. Yes. Yes, Peter? I, I have no problem with them put, putting on there, but I, I think that they're going to be hurting themselves if, if they put it on right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think we should do it. I think the questions on this ballot 
aren't going to come back to her. They're going to come back to us. And they're going to come back to our staff. What, what does this mean? Well, I, I think. And, and our staff and us are going to be put in the position that we have to go back to the petitioner and try to get details as to what this means. It's not ready. It's not ripe. It's late. It's vague, as Peter said. It's, it's the best word for it. Um, you can't put this kind of stuff out there in front of the voters. Stuff you put out in front of the voters got to be very specific, and they have to understand that what they're voting for. Almost like a ballot question where you say, if you vote for this, this is going to happen, and if you vote for that, that's going to happen. They have to have that clarity and, and this... But like I said, I don't like to discourage young people from, like Dan says, getting involved in the process. And I'm always encouraged when I see that. Um, it's just logistically, I don't think this can happen. So I don't think we need a vote on that. Do we need a formal vote, Bob? It just says um, if you decline, uh, you're not forced. Do we need a more formal vote, Mary? Sounds like we do. I don't think you do. No. I don't think we do. Okay. And you're just not voting it to. Then let's declare that the sense of the board is that we will not put this on the on the um, on the ballot and leave it at that and put that in the minutes, okay? Because that's my determination after conferencing with my colleagues on the board, and we will not be putting Carolyn, Carolyn's article on. But we still got to consider the school article. And we have, was there a formal motion drafted on this? Yes. And um, I can read it for you. Yeah, would you please? It would be the proposed ballot question would be ballot question number one. Shall the town of Yarmouth be allowed to assess an additional $880,000 in real estate and personal property taxes for the purpose of funding operational expenses for the Dennis Yarmouth Regional School District for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2024, question mark, uh, indicating yes or no. I'd make so a motion. It just has the question without mentioning two and a half. It just has the number. Yes, correct. And that is, there's a specific form that the state requires you to use, and so we've used the specific so it form. it goes on the ballot, it will say it's, it will say it's an o over two and a half. No, it, it, it reads exactly like I just read it. And All right, Mary, Mary, you want to say anything? I'm agreeing with our, with our town administrator. It's going to be put on the ballot exactly as it's town council. Way. Exactly as town council has drafted it. With the um, with the statements for what a yes and means and what a no means. Right. So that so that part of it. Um, and remember, under the special legislation, town council will draft um, a very brief statement: what a yes vote means, what a no vote means. And that doesn't go on the ballot, but it's it goes um, posted at the polling places. Okay. It's not on the question, but there'd be an explanation there at the ballot. They will. I, I believe the yes and no, I'm not sure whether the yes or no under the new version goes on the ballot. I will double check that. Uh, okay. but, but we are required to put the ballot question and the explanations at each of the polling locations 10 days in advance of, the, of a question under the special legislation from 2010. I don't expect that number to change as a result of town meeting, but what if it did? The um, number has to be done first because of the 35 days so um, it would still be it would allow the 880 um, say for instance if if the budget wound up being cut um, you wouldn't have to raise the whole amount but it creates additional levy capacity so the number would stay the same correct even if the budget were cut at town meeting that is correct Okay, so. All right. How do you feel about that, Mark? Are you willing to support that? Yes. Dan? I am. Torcas? Yes. Peter? I, I support it, and I would hope that the DY school committee gets their budget together. Okay. 
I would support it as well. We need a vote on that. We do. We need a formal motion and vote. Uh, Make a motion that we approve a, a letter. ballot question one. So Dan has a motion to approve ballot question one. Do I have a second? Second. All right. We'll do a roll call on that just to be very safe. Uh, Mark. Aye. Dan. Aye. Dorcas. Aye. Peter. Aye. I vote aye as well. So that's done. Thank you very much. Do you think we have to sign off or anything on that? Or is the vote good enough? Um, I need to do a letter in the send morning. Send us a letter. So, so we write a letter saying on this date the board vote, voted five to nothing in that. All right. So. Thank you. That will do the job. Thank you very much. All right. We are ready, I guess, for the next item, which is conservation restriction in land management plan for Higgins Crow Road. Good evening. Good evening. So um, Bob is putting up a slide with um, the location of the parcel that I think everyone is uh, familiar with. Um, so my name's Karen Green. I'm the Director of Community Development. I'm here with Kelly Grant, who now works with the Compact of Cape Cod Conservation Trusts. Um, so back in November of 2022, the town voted to acquire the parcels on Higgins Kroll Road um, that total close to 10 acres. It's 9.6 something uh, acres. Um, we negotiated, and the chairman's very familiar with this, uh, and closed on the property back in December of 2023. Um, over that time, we've been working hard on um, just fulfilling all of the different grant obligations that we have. If you remember, we have a Community Preservation Act grant for $600 thousand dollars we also received a drinking water supply program grant um, because we took the parcel for water protection and that money came from uh, the Commonwealth um, some of the requirements of those two funding uh, programs are that we execute a conservation restriction on the parcels and also that we have a land management plan in place so we called up the compact to help us uh, put together those documents um, Kelly's here to uh, do a brief explanation of them, and then it would be our hope that the board uh, votes to execute those documents. We can record them at the Registry of Deeds, and uh, we're one step further to being uh, kind of completely finished with all of our grant obligations. Yeah, I think I know the answer to this question, but are these approvals a prerequisite to getting those funds? They are. I figured that, okay. They are. Yeah, and also Makes that, sense. Yeah, requirement yeah. of the CPA funding. Yes. Did you open this? Yeah. Right. So, would you like a little overview of what's sure. in the? Sure. We miss you, Kelly. Two? Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so, this is a fairly standard CR document. We use the um, the state's model for conservation restrictions, and um, then adapted it to to this particular project. So, it runs through the purposes of the document, the allowed and and um, prohibited uses. Um, and uh, then other than that, it's really just the, the standard language for, um, you know, monitoring uh, the, the property for, to make sure that the values of the conservation restriction are upheld. The, um, the conservation restrictions being granted by the select board through the Board of Water Commissioners to the Yarmouth Conservation Trust, who voted to, to hold the CR for the town, so that means that they're responsible for monitoring the property annually to make sure that the conditions are, are of the conservation restriction are upheld. Um, <laughs> there's lots of signature pages for you to, <laughs> to, to execute for us to um, finalize the document, and then what will happen is that we'll send the document up to the um, state for final approval from the secretary. She'll provide her signatures, and then we'll have the, um, can have the document recorded. Um, alongside that is the um, baseline documentation report in the land management plan um, and this basically is documenting the conditions at the property as they are at the moment um, using um, GPS locations and photos and then just descriptors of the property and then that will provide the baseline for the annual monitoring that the Yarmouth Conservation Trust will, will do on the property. 
So um, unless you want any other particular detail, I'm really just kind of happy to answer any questions that you might have on any of the content of the, of the document. Anybody have any questions or comments? Mr. Chairman? Yeah, um, for, the, for the benefit of the people that are watching our meeting tonight, um, the history of this particular acquisition is, is fairly straightforward. Um, this was an initiative by the Board of Selectmen to make sure that we take added steps to protect the critical water supplies in this particular area of the town. Uh, the land that's being acquired is within the watershed of municipal drinking water supplies and um, the zone two is what it's called but uh, it's an important area and the board I think this is on, on our list of accomplishments I think this is one one of many that we're, we're very proud of and um, I think we knew, we knew more or less at the time that in receiving state funds there would be some restrictions of this sort so nothing that's being presented tonight is a surprise that to, nor should it be to anyone um, and I'm just thrilled that we were able to make this acquisition and I I want to commend the, the town staff Karen and uh, Bob uh, for their hard work in pulling this off this was not easy it was a little bit challenging in the beginning but we ultimately did it and I also want to thank the voters in the town of Yarmouth because at town meeting this was very strongly supported by the people in town I think it's a recognition that Protecting these kinds of open spaces are incredibly important in terms of our future uh, as a community. And so um, I think this is a very important night, and uh, I'm happy to support this uh, proposal in front of us. Did we get any independent review of this by our council? He did review. He did? He did. Very good. Dan? I have no questions. I'm supportive. Dorcas? Very supportive. Peter. Again, very supportive. And also, also want to thank the Diocese of Fall River to, uh, for their very good and clean negotiation on, on the sale of this property. And, and it very definitely in, protects uh, the well that's right ne right, essentially right next, next door to this, this, this property. Thank you. Selectman Stone is, as well, our chief negotiator um, we learned a lot. Hmm. Okay, do we do we have a? Um, we need a formal motion on this. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board accept and execute the <laughs> conservation restriction and land management plan as presented this evening for the ten lots of land located totally totaling nine point six eight nine acres on Higgins Curl Road. Second. Second. Okay, we have a motion. A second. Let's do a roll call. Is this an important vote? Mark? Aye. Ian? Aye. Marcus? Aye. Peter? Aye. Chair votes aye. That's unanimous. Do we have a, um, a clean signature page that we can sign? Have. In the red file? It's, you have it. I think it was in the red Is this the one that you have? There should be no, three you pages. Have huh? Mike, Mike, it's right in there in your board of selectmen. Oh, it's in here? Yeah. Okay. There should be three Mark, separate signature signed. pages. Okay, this, uh, oh, everybody's did sign it. Just waiting for you. <laughs> okay, that's done. There's three of them. There's three of them. Three. There's three? Yeah. Yeah. Mike. Oh, they certify the vote. Mike. Here and then here. Oh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, while you're signing that, may I ask a question? I found it interesting that when I was coming down Higgins Crawl Road uh, this week, there is a sign up for land auction north of um, this particular property. And does the town know anything about that? Because that is also something that would be um, right in the area. It was land auction J. Manning. Hmm. I am not aware of it. I will drive in that way tomorrow morning. Appreciate it. Dorcas, could you point to the map roughly where this par parcel is located? Yeah, well, I think Dan. 
Uh, here? Where it is is it's um, south of the uh, of the dog grooming place, the industrial park. Is that on your map there? Uh, I just don't. I think that might be further. Is it further north, Kathy? No, I think we're talking about it's, it's here. Yeah. No, it's, because it's the town south of the uh, dog park. May I ask what's the, what the parcel of land south of the dog park is? Is, the, is? Do I have the pointer on the dog park? I would have to sure. take a look, Dorcas. I can't really. Uh, I, I find it very surprising. I just saw auction and immediately yeah, was it, thinking it of. Maybe, and I think the town did own one or both of these at one point where the pond is. I think that's another, that may be another Kroll pond. Is it another Kroll pond? And to the right of um, wh where your pointer is, the, you almost had it. Yeah, down a little, now to the right. To the right, over, there, there you are. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> are you testing me? <laughs> I, it, it is is that across trail. the street in the industrial park? No, this is a residential neighborhood. Yeah. I think at Lumberjack Trail, did I hear? Yeah, and it, then it's, this it's is slower, Ansel Hallett. Right. Up. No, no. Is this Ansel? Okay. Oh, that's Mid Tech Drive. I'm sorry, my bad. This is this is Ansel. Oh, okay. Well, then we're if, if that's Mid Tech Drive, then the dog park is. Um, on the same side as Lumberjack, but come down to the next space over. I, do you, would you like the pointer? Oh, my eye, hand, my eye hand coordination is awful, but how do you point? Uh, the red dot. See the red dot? There, that one. This one? Yes. Okay, is this, what's this land right here? That's a well water. That's the well water department. That's the well, well field. Okay. And this is the industrial park right here, Mid Tech Drive? Right. Yes. So that means that the dog park would be, I mean, the dog, um, the dog groomer would be over here. Or would it be this way? I mean, I, I don't know. Tomorrow. Yeah, the, the dog, the dog groomer, the dog groomer is south of south of the property. Lumberjack is. Um, that you're on Lumberjack right there. Okay, Lumberjack. I'm sorry. Lumberjack is south of the property. The dog groomer is north of the property, and it's the land in between. Okay. I will drive that way tomorrow. And there's an auction sign up right now, for Jay Manning. All right, thank you, ladies. Thank you. We are ready now for open space and recreation plant update. Good evening. Whenever you're ready, Kathy. I'm Kathy Williams, town planner. Uh, with me, I have Christine Marzigliano. She's the vice chair of the Open Space and Rec Plan Ad Hoc Committee. We also have Ellie Lawrence. And then from recreation, <laughs> we have Debbie Clark. And then we also have Bill Benetti, uh, who's been an active staff member. I'm sorry, conservation. And then also on the uh, Zoom, we have Anthony Bennett, the recreation director, and also Brittany DiBienzo, the conservation administrator. All very important components to, to, the, to the puzzle here. Um, 
So some of the planning process, the Conservation Commission developed an open space and rec, rec plan ad hoc committee. Uh, they wanted to take on uh, different representatives from different existing committees that kind of represented everybody. So we had Will Rubenstein, he's the chair and he's from the planning board, he's not here this evening. Uh, Christine, from, who's our vice chair from the open space, Ellie, who's Conservation Commission, uh, Steve Sozanski, who's Recreation Commission, and then Gal Charette, who is the Disability uh, Commission representative. Uh, we had lots of town staff that are involved that are represented there, and we also had a lot of different communications with um, other departments as well. And then we were also fortunate to get some funding from the Conservation Commission through the Conservation Fund to hire Weston and Sampson to help us with uh, this endeavor. So the open space and rec plan is something that we need to update every seven years, and it also needs to be uh, meet the requirements of the Massachusetts uh, Division of Conservation Services. So it's very prescriptive with regard to the information that you need to include in it. Uh, as part of that process, we also need to have approval from the Planning Board, the Select Board, and the Cape Cod Commission, and final approval from the Division of Conservation Services, or DCS. We do have those letters from the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, the Cape Cod Commission, and then we also have conditional approval um, from DCS. So we're kind of looking for your support this evening so that we can finalize the Open Space and Recreation Plan. So what is kind of the purpose of it? Uh, as I mentioned, we want to be sure that you update it every seven years because it also makes us eligible for a bunch of different grant opportunities, which the town has been able to partake in through land water conservation funds and park grants, both of which we did receive uh, for the Riverwalk Park project. And it's also a major building block of our local comprehensive plan. We just had our kickoff meeting with BSC Group um, last Wednesday with the planning board. So we're moving forward with that, with that part of um, the project. So we're really looking, what are you going to look at? We want to make sure that we're updating the progress that we've made. Um, one nice thing about these types of plans is we have made an enormous amount of progress. We have the, uh, the Cape Cod Rail Trail. We've got the Packet Landing pavi Pavilion. We have pickleball courts at Flax Pond. Uh, we did the Baxter Gristmill Dam and the Fish Ladder. Um, so there's a lot of great things that have actually uh, happened in the town since the last uh, open space and rec plan. We also want to take another look at all our community information, our environmental inventory and analysis, and as well as all the conservation and recreation lands that we have, as well as evaluating what are our town's current needs and goals for open space and recreation. And ultimately, we want to identify specific action items that we can do in order to meet these goals, basically for these different components of managing, protecting, and improving our natural resources in open space, and also being sure that we're providing a lot of active and passive recreation uh, for not just our residents, but our visitors as well. And then providing that framework for, for decision making as we move forward. So we had a lot of public participation in development of this plan. We started off in February of 2023 with an open house. Uh, we had an initial presentation and then we had four different topic tables with facilitators to garner specific input from people uh, attending the meeting. We also had a winter survey and we had 475 responses to that. We we're really looking at people's opinions of the current open space and recreation facilities that we have. How frequently are they using? How well aware are they of all the different things that we have in town? And what might be their interests in having for conservation and recreation programming needs? We kind of also discussed a little bit some preliminary goals. So we identified, used all this information to help identify some very specific uh, objectives and action items, which were then vetted through the second survey. Uh, that we conducted. We developed a full draft of the open space plan and we uh, went out for a 30-day public comment period last September. Uh, and we also gave formal presentations to the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission. And, and we did receive comments from the Cape Cod Commission, the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, DCS, and then we got written comments from about nine to 10 um, members of the public. Uh, the ad hoc committee met, went through all these different comments, and then they incorporated the red line edits that you see uh, in the hard copies that you guys received of the Open Space and Rec Plan. So one of the first things that we need to do is talk about our community setting. How, where are we in, in with regard to our, um, basically our locations, our surroundings, our three villages. We want to talk about our history, how we got, start, where we started from and how we got to where we are today. We want to talk about our, all of our historic areas that we have. Uh, our historical uh, commission actually helped us rewrite some of this section so it would be as, as accurate as possible. We also want to look at some population characteristics, our demographics, what's the average age. Obviously, we all know we have a slightly older population. So that might play a role in the type of recreational open space uh, activities that we want to be promoting. We also took a look at the growth and development patterns, so kind of where are we with our patterns and trends. We obviously have our main commercial corridors on 6A and Route 28, and we're also very heavily residential. So there's not a lot of uh, open land left for any type of development. 
So we also looked at the infrastructure with our transportation. We have three main state highways that go through um, the town. We are going to have two major projects in addition to the sewer, but two major Route uh, 28 Mass DOT projects that are going to be coming uh, in the near future. We also have obviously our sewer project that we're working on, and then we also gave um, additional information with regard to our drinking water, the 975 acres that are protected. Again, I added the 10 acres from this evening conservation restriction, uh, our 24 wells, and then our different storage tanks. And then we also talked about long-term development patterns, you know, really promoting more infill and redevelopment over any type of greenfield development, and then also using that mixed use so we retain our commercial corridor while also uh, addressing some of our housing needs. So we also did a very detailed environmental inventory and analysis. Uh, we looked at the geology, soils, and topography, unlike some other places uh, throughout our, our, our state. Those are really not restrictions to or impediments to development uh, here. So we really have been able to develop rather freely based on our geology, soil, and topography. We also looked at our land uh, landscape character, you know, 30 miles of, of coastline, our over 1,200 acres of salt marsh. We have our beautiful scenic vistas, uh, ponds, cranberry bogs, historic areas. All of that is detailed uh, um, quite extensively in, in this report. We also talk about all of our water resources, um, our freshwater kettle ponds, all of our saltwater resources, our, our tidal um, rivers and tributaries. We have all our beaches, our marinas, and there's boat launches and moorings. So all of that's very detailed in here as well. Surface water quality, we, we know that we have some issues with surface water quality. That's why we're doing um, our wastewater program. Uh, but we also have some impediments that come from stormwater as well as uh, fertilizers that we need to make sure that we're cognizant of. We went, reviewed our floodplains and our wetlands. We obviously have an extensive number of both of those in our community, and we reviewed our existing wetland regulations. We also looked at, at our groundwater resources. We know with the septic systems and stormwater and fertilizer that we do have some uh, concern with um, nitrates, but our real issue is PFAS, and we do have that um, mobile re reusable PFAS treatment for wells number four and five, which is it operating, Lori, right now? very soon we'll be operating. So we're making a lot of progress with that. And then just discussions of the vegetation, fisheries, and wildlife, not exactly my forte, but it kind of talks about the different species uh, that we have here in town, and then also looking at very specific uh, scenic resources in our unique areas within our community. We also looked at our environmental challenges. I think we all kind of are aware of this uh, somewhat already. We looked at contamination sites. We don't have an extensive number of contamination sites, but we do have the former town landfill as well, and the, as, well as the Acme Laundry. We looked at the water resources, which might be feeling some um, pressures, obviously, from water quality as well as pressures from development. Uh, wastewater impacts, stormwater and fertilizer, as I mentioned previously. Uh, housing needs, we have an extensive housing need in town, so is that putting some pressure on some of our open spaces and our environmental resources that we not also want to be protecting? Erosion and sedimentation and flooding as a coastal community, those are things that we always need to be thinking of, especially with sea, sea level rise and as storms may be becoming more frequent and being more severe. Uh, and forestry, we want to make sure that we're protecting our woodlands from any type of, of excessive development. And then environmental equity, really making sure that there's fair treatment and involvement for everyone in our community, and that also means access to recreation and open space facilities. We did a very detailed inventory and visited all of our um, recreation and conservation lands. Uh, we end up having over 1,600 acres of actively used recreation and conservation lands, including the parks, um, fields, golfs, and, and beaches. So that's an extensive uh, number. There's a detailed table, 5-6, uh, which goes over all of those in very detail uh, and describes kind of like the condition of each facility as well as um, all the different things and amenities that are available on there. Uh, most frequently visited sites, I don't think any of those are, are a surprise to any of us. Uh, we all like our smugglers in Seagull Beach, as well as um, Flax Pond Recreation is very um, important to the kids in the camp, Gray's Beach and Basshole Boardwalk, Peter Homer Park, and, and Taylor Bray Farm. Again, we did the inventory, the same thing with all of our, con our eight conservation areas and lands that we have in town, and kind of detailed uh, there. So we developed, through all of this information, a broad vision statement, which really uh, was relatively simple. It was to maintain, expand, and protect our valuable open space and conservation lands, while also providing year-round, multi-generational recreational opportunities to enhance the quality of life uh, for our community. We did do a rather detailed analysis of, 
analysis of needs uh, in our community, and I think everyone really felt we needed to actively manage, maintain, and protect our natural resources in open space, as well as improving our environmental resources, uh, either through studies that we might be doing or planning on doing or specific projects. Uh, expanding our open space for recreation, natural resource protection, and just the great quality of life that we have here on Cape Cod. Uh, and also maintaining and upgrading amenities at existing open space properties, really focusing on projects that are already underway and are already funded or studies that are currently underway. And as we get into the action items, you'll see that we have a significant number of projects um, that are making some very good progress. Uh, we also want to be sure that we're offering and expanding recreational programming, and we want to clear, include that to be year-round as well, and again, uh, for all ages, and expanding it and emphasizing it into the fall and winter uh, when we have less recreational opportunities. We're looking to improve our signage and wayfinding uh, at existing properties to help people get around once they get in there. Uh, we also want to be sure that people are more aware of our open space and recreation opportunities. I think some, th some of the things that we found in some of the surveys is not people, people were not fully aware of all the great things that we do have here in town. And of course, we always want to make sure that we're upgrading our accessibility, uh, ex <coughs> ADA accessibility at all of our facilities. One of the things that's required um, in the open space and rec plan is to evaluate how does our community uh, stand up against communities of similar size. And you'll see that we do fairly well, very well with our recreational facilities. And we're actually above um, a lot of the median uh, similar sized uh, population communities uh, around the country. I think the one thing I would like to emphasize is like things for like fields. Sometimes it was difficult to count fields because one of a rectangular field might be the outfield of a baseball field. So even though you're counting both of them, those two sports can't be happening at the same time because they're conflicting with each other. And there's also a lot of fields that are done at the schools through DY or the, or the intermediate school that really aren't available for recreational programs um, through the town because they're being used at the same time. Uh, especially things like tennis courts uh, that are available at DY, but they, aren't, they can't be used during the school time and they also can't be used during the uh, tennis season when they're in use uh, by, the, by the students. So compiling all this information, we came up with four relatively uh, simple and straightforward community goals. The first goal was to maintain and manage our open space and conservation properties. The second was to expand the amount that we have. The third is to protect and improve environmental resources, water quality, and open space. And the fourth is really uh, emphasizing recreation by providing that year-round active recreational opportunities and increasing public awareness of our town-owned lands and facilities. So we took those goals and we tried to develop objectives and specific action items that we could take in order to meet those particular goals. Table 9-2 uh, in the report outlines all of these in more detail and also uh, identifies a timeline of when they might be able to happen, what the priority is, potential funding uh, opportunities for these, as well as responsible parties, who's, who's going to be responsible for championing and moving these items forward. So the first objective one there is to pursue funding for maintenance at open space and conservation properties. So we're really looking as an action item to explore use of civic organizations or associations, AmeriCorps, the Scouts, or volunteers for specific maintenance projects. We've been very successful with using AmeriCorps and the Scouts on certain projects, and I think we might have some opportunity maybe for some civic organizations uh, for the West Yarmouth Parks moving in the, uh, moving in the future. The second objective is to develop invasive species management plan. The first action item there is pursue grants for invasive species removal on town lands or water bodies. You'll know that, notice that there's two such funding uh, requests on the town meeting warrant, one from DNR and one from conservation. Uh, we, conservation also received funds from the tourism revenue preservation funds also for invasive species management. So that's actively underway. The second uh, item there is to develop educational programs to reduce unintentional uh, introduction of invasive species. And the third is to investigate and monitor known invasive species areas. So obviously we want to, um, lots of times invasive species are introduced inadvertently or by accident. So through education and monitoring, hopefully we can prevent them or nip them in the bud uh, before they become a serious problem. Continuing with goal number one, objective 1C is to continue ongoing land management activities. And the action item is to continue applying for grants for prescribed burn and mechanical vegetation removal. And this is something that really helps the wildlife habitat and the native plant community to, to flourish. Objective 1D there is to continue to enforce appropriate and legal use of conservation areas. Uh, D1 is investigate and address illegal dumping and encroachments. DNR conservation do regularly do that when they uh, become aware of these situations. 
the second action item there is to install signage, um, such as denoting when hunting seasons are being done at multi-use areas. There's some areas like in Calorie Darling where there's a marsh where there's hunting that's allowed, but then there's actually a trail that goes by there. So just letting people know that certain times of the year there might be both of these things happening at the same time. And I believe that DNR also does that as well. Um, item three there is installing the trail blaze and markers to keep people on maintained trails so they're not going off the trails and getting into sensitive areas. And again, that's something that DNR is actively doing uh, at this time. And the last one there is evaluate town land open for hunting and access, assess if any changes are needed based on new land uses. The last time the hunting map was done uh, and investigated uh, was back in 2013. And we have some changes in, in land uses on town-owned property. We have the water resource recovery facility that's going in. We also have the Cape Cod Rail Trail that's going through some town-owned land. So it just might be um, a time just to take another look at that and see if those maps um, still apply. And then we also have additional town-owned land, such as the land that we've purchased recently on Higgins Crawl, and maybe we can address that in, in the um, hunting map as well. So going, moving on to goal number two of expanding the amount of open space and conservation land. Uh, objective 2A is there, identify and preserve land for natural resources and drinking water protection, passive recreation, and quality of life and aesthetics. The first one, and I think Christine's going to take this on, I think in this open space committee, of taking a look at the annual review of our tax delinquent tax title properties and see if any of them should be designated specifically for conservation or open space or recreation. Uh, the second item there is to develop a list of properties that we might want to purchase because they have a particular value, uh, like protecting critical habitats, rare and endangered species, wetlands, wildlife corridors, uh, undeveloped or private recreation land. So if a large parcel were to come on the market, that might be something the town would be interested in. If a, if a, even if you have a smaller parcel but it abuts a conservation land, that might be something that we want to look at. And then obviously we want things to preserve our drinking water uh, and also salt marsh migration and also if there's any archaeological or cultural resources on a property that we might want to purchase to protect. The, the third item there is investigating acquiring a 10.46 acre property off White Walk Road uh, owned by NSTAR. This is near and dear to Christine's heart. Um, to, this is the property that's located near uh, Little Green Oak Pond as well as the historic societies and the idea of seeing a giant substation there would be, would be heartbreaking. Uh, so seeing if there's some other way we can broker some type of trade with NSTAR was, is something that would be val valuable. The fourth item there is to pursue grants and acquisitions, identified parcels through either donations, deed of gifts, uh, conservation restriction, or purchase. One of the things I did notice when I went through all of our conservation lands that we do have a lot of those lands were given to us as gifts. Um, so that's something that's good. The third uh, goal here is to protect, improve environmental resources, water quality, and open space. The first objective there is to promote stormwater treatment, recharge, uh, and flood control with best management practices. And the action item is to continue funding stormwater management projects throughout town. I think engineering department's done a great job. There's a long list of the different stormwater projects that uh, we, we have done in town. They've also gotten a lot of uh, CZM grants in order to do those particular projects. Uh, the next objective there is to explore ways to improve water quality and reduce nitrogen and nutrient levels. And the first action item there is really continuing to implement the municipal wastewater program, which is so important um, for that goal, for that objective. The second one is the fertilizer education program. That is something that we do now through the MS4 in the spring, so we'll be continuing to, to do that. Uh, the third item is to assist the Cape Cod Commission on the Freshwater Initiative, develop actions to protect and restore the Cape's freshwater resources. Um, they've made a lot of progress on this. They actually have a Cape uh, Cod Ponds Atlas with an interactive map, so you can go to the different ponds and get some general information in the town of Yarmouth. They also are do working on a monitoring program, and I believe they're monitoring James Pond, Dennis Pond, and West Sandy Pond here in the town of Yarmouth. They have also are working on an economic analysis of Cape Cod ponds, like what are the values that they bring uh, compared to the, the costs of not um, of having their water quality go down. They've had multiple stakeholder meetings, and there are also uh, some additional ongoing activities that they're working on. Um, the last one item there is to complete the long pond study um, to assess water quality and health of the pond and impact from nutrients. Uh, the DNR has hired Horsley Witten and they have been collecting data to do modeling of pollutant loading uh, in Long Pond and they're hoping to have the report uh, in September. 
Continuing with goals number three objective is to promote tidal restoration projects to improve tidal flushing and foster healthy ecosystems. Uh, the first action item there, which you guys are familiar with, is the um, tidal restoration projects initiated by the Friends of Bass River uh, for the culverts uh, to change into bridges of the North Dennis Pond and also the Weir Road. Uh, the second action item there is advance the Run Pond Tidal Restoration Project on South Shore Drive. The Friends of Bass, Bass River have actually put in a CPA application. It's going to be on the warrant uh, to have a fund to do some feasibility analysis on re restoring that um, tidal restriction. Number 3D, pursuing wetland restoration projects. Again, the first action item there is not only are the Friends of Bass River have been working on a tidal restoration project, but they also want to do a complete uh, restoration of the retired cranberry bogs and restore that back to natural uh, wetlands up near Hamlin's Brook in the upper reaches of the Bass River. The third item is helping to identify any future restoration projects and seek grant funding for um, wetlands and restoration. Uh, I do know that the, um, the Bayview Bog Wetland Restoration Project is something that's been going on with the Cape Cod uh, Conservation District. Um, so there's always good to identify future wetland uh, restoration projects. Continuing with goal number three is develop educational tools and best management practices. Um, I think the more we know, the more we can protect our environment. Uh, so the first action item there is to distribute and publicize updated fact sheets and education <coughs> materials from CZM. Uh, these are very easy, friendly, very visual uh, fact sheets that people can use to, to talk about how they can address stormwater and reduce erosion on their property. Next objective is to further protection of the wetland resources through identification and regulation. The first action item there is to conduct vernal pool certifications each spring with the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program. We have seven of them that have been certified on town-owned properties. Um, since that program began, and I believe the Conservation Administrator is going to continue to work on that. The next objective is to further protect wetlands resource, oh, I'm, excuse me. The action item is update Yarmouth's wetland bylaw and regulations to expand jurisdiction um, and add protection to vernal pools and land subject to coastal f storm flowage. I think you all know that we also have the uh, wetland bylaw changes that are also on the warrant for the annual town meeting as well. So, the next objective is to pursue dredging projects, and the action item was to complete the 10-year permit for dredging of Lewis Bay, Parker's River, and Bass River. Completed last October after I don't even know how many years of effort uh, that has gone into that, and they have actually removed 7,000 cubic feet approximately of material from the Bass River and Parker's River's approach and at the entrances of those channels, and the spoils went to... Um, to Bass River and Thatcher Town Beach in Yarmouth, and then also in conjunction with uh, Dennis, some of them went to the West, um, West Dennis Beach as well. The next item is to address the impacts uh, of climate change. <coughs> so the action item is to complete low-lying road study in collaboration with the Cape Cod Commission and Woods Hole. Uh, the two, two roads that the town of Yarmouth were looking at was the Run Pond Road and also Thatcher Shore Road. Uh, that Thatcher Shore Road is currently under design for the culvert replacement. That's been a long-standing project that's been a problem. Um, and then Run Pond, I guess, was ultimately determined that it wasn't going to be uh, feasible in order to make uh, any adjustments there. But staff is also pursuing an MVP grant for the FY25 Action Grant to look at vulnerable public um, roadways south of Route 28 to identify whether there's any um, actually cost-effective projects that could be done that would facilitate people getting out of that community, maintaining connectivity should there be some additional flooding in those areas. Number two, uh, number two there is complete an infrastructure vulnerability assessment on municipal assets and develop a list of highest priorities. That has been completed with Woods Hole. Um, they did a very detailed analysis. Uh, the good news is that in the near term, municipal buildings that provide um, town services are relatively safe. But as you can imagine, the bad news is that the highest risks are assets that are water or coastal dependent. So Packet Landing Marina, Wilbur Park Boat Dock, Gray's Beach Boat Dock, Englewood Beach Pier and Swan Pond Boardwalks are all susceptible. Uh, moving on with goal number three, um, objective, concentrate development in suitable areas to preserve meaningful open space, promote infill and redevelopment over greenfield development, and pursue natural vegetation. 
The first action item is there to explore various housing types, such as top of shop housing and seasonal employee housing within existing developed areas. We ha do have uh, temporary seasonal housing options uh, within our de developed areas, but I think we need to start looking at maybe increasing uh, the density allowed as long as it's top of shop. Again, preserving our, our commercial uh, corridor on the first level, but then allowing for additional housing on the second level. The second action item there is to consider amending land clearing and alteration permit criteria to limit clearings of lots and leaving them vacant, uh, which apparently uh, can encourage invasive species and illegal dumping. Not an excessively problematic problem that we have in Yarmouth, but something that we might want to take a look at. The third action is to review existing cluster development zoning and consider changes mm -hmm. to promote this use, um, which clusters the development but also preserves uh, open space. Number four is all, all related to our recreational uh, facilities. The first objective is to expand active recreational opportunities with an emphasis on completion of projects and studies currently underway. And you'll see that we have about 12 of them that are listed here. We're looking to complete the design and construction of the Cape Cod, the third phase of the Cape Cod Rail Trail, basically from Peter Homer Park all the way over to Barnstable, um, have a bridge over Willow Street and the railroad tracks. It should be going out to bid uh, this summer and starting construction in the fall and going through 2026. We want to complete the Higgins Kroll Road shared use pathway from Buck Island northward to the roundabout. The first two phases have been completed and the third phase began in March. Uh, unfortunately, that required a lot of utility pole relocation, so that's kind of what they're concentrating on now. Uh, but they should be completed with the, that final connection through phase three uh, in May of 2025. This is another thing that we had on our list, but we've actually completed it. We have completed construction of the accessible playground and splash pad at Sandy Pond, including restroom improvements, I believe it was with electricity and, and also to automated uh, locking doors so we could expand the time when the restrooms would be available to people. So this is something when we started it, we were still working on it, but then we've actually completed it. Something that's near and dear to my heart is completing permitting construction of the Riverwalk Park boardwalk and event space at the former uh, drive-in facility. Um, we've ended up breaking the project into two phases. Phase one is the majority of the site work, including the boardwalk, uh, and that is currently out to bid, and the uh, bids are anticipated to be open on April 26th. Um, the second phase would include all of the restroom and that little area on that knoll, uh, which is being, it's bids under a different mass general law, which is more restrictive. Um, so we're bidding that separately, and that's hopefully going to go out to bid in June of 2024. We did this hoping that we would get the best prices by separating the work out into two different uh, uh, components. All work is anticipated to be completed by August of 2025. This is uh, completion construction of the West Yarmouth Parks Restoration and Pedestrian Bridge bridge project. Um, as you all know, we, built, we purchased 275 uh, Route 28, the former Yankee Village Motel. It was torn down, and now we're going to be combining it with Chase Brook Park and Mill, Mill Creek Park and having a five and a half acre waterfront uh, park. Uh, they are having a project information meeting tomorrow night here in this room at 530 and also remote uh, access if you're interested in finding out more about that project, which includes accessible walkways, invasive species management, and also some low maintenance uh, landscaping. Complete building improvements um, for historic structures, the Taylor Bray Farm barn and the Baxter Gristmill. Taylor Bray Farm, they've completed the foundation repairs in phase one, uh, with phase two contract has been signed for some exterior work to windows, doors, and siding, and that work is supposed, supposed to be completed in the summer of 2024. The Baxter Gristmill, we have completed the dam work and the fish ladder work that you can, can see there, uh, but we do need to uh, look at the different ways of restoring the historic building on the site. So some of the other studies that we have out there, we, do, we are looking to complete the Recreation Capital Assessment and Improvement Plan. $120,000 was funded for that in 2022 special town meeting. Uh, also, we have funding for the Mattakees Middle School Reuse Assessment, and during that analysis, consider recreational opportunities and programming, and maybe even possibly of a community center uh, during that analysis. Um, we want to, under action item nine, is incorporate sidewalks, bike lanes, and shared use pathways into roadway projects, including all of our mass DOT projects. The two mass DOT projects on Route 28 both have shared use pathways on the south side uh, of those projects. 
Number 10 is evaluate complete street programs and consider establishing a bike ped committee. One of the things that really uh, was discussed a lot in the different surveys was people really wanted to be able to walk and bike around the community a little bit better. Uh, and so maybe developing some type of master plan and how we might be able to make that uh, happen uh, is kind of what we're looking at in action item 10 there. Action 11, investigate needs and ways of creating additional year-round indoor recreation facilities, programs using public-private partnerships. I think the recreation department does that very well now. Um, they will have swimming through the local hotel, hotels. They get to use their pools. So as a public-private, we're not necessarily investing in an infrastructure, but we do have the ability to partner with people who have that infrastructure. Another item is obviously we, golf is very important in the town of Yarmouth, and we want to continue with the Yarmouth Golf Five-Year Capital Improvement Plan uh, at the two town golf courses at Bayberry Hills and the Bass River Golf Course. The next objective here is to expand the use of existing facilities, and the first uh, action item there is really improving that communication and the information so people are fully aware of what we have uh, and also promoting that. The second item is evaluating increasing hours of the restroom op operations and seasonality. There's a lot of comments about maybe the restrooms closing a little bit too early in the day and also maybe not being out into the shoulder seasons enough for people. Um, we want to be sure that we have uh, are addressing our restroom accessibility issues. We want to make sure that everyone can use the restrooms. Uh, item four is there complete a comprehensive inventory and map of town ways to water, including available parking, and then also conducting a needs assessment at the various public water access points. And this is something that's also on the warrant for CPA. DNR put in a CPA um, request uh, to get those items four and five done, uh, and it'll be voted on at annual town meeting. So that is moving forward. Uh, objective 4C is maintain and upgrade existing facilities. So one of the first things that the action items is once that recreation and capital assessment has been completed, we might want to take a look at the master plans that were done for Platts Pond, Sandy Pond, and Peter Homer Park and really see if that's exactly what we want to be doing there now, depending on what our current needs might be. Uh, item number two is prioritize addition of pickleball courts at, at Sandy Pond. People really wanted to have additional pickleball port excuse me, pickleball courts, and it seemed like Sandy Pond might have the place for it, but they also wanted to look into maybe doing some tournament play, so maybe that's something that, that gets evaluated um, when a Mattakees gets looked at as well. Um, evaluate year-round use of pickleball courts at Flax Pond. I believe that that's actually been going on now. They were able to, to make that happen. Uh, and pickleballers are really looking for some additional amenities such as lights, maybe some additional uh, painting, windscreens, and, and shade structures at those facilities. Uh, action item three is, you know, per the updated master plans, just continue phasing in the improvements at those three major parks at Sandy, Peter Homer, and Flax. And then the last one there is ensuring that we improve our signage of trails for awareness, but also wayfinding uh, within, a tr within a facility, but also maybe to some other attractions and businesses that people might be interested in going to as well. And that was a comment that came out of um, the review that was done of the full uh, draft plan, so it was a good one. Continuing with um, Objective 4C, uh, review and improve um, ADA accessible water accessibility um, by upgrading Moby mats and Moby chairs. We have 12 brand new Moby chairs right now. We have three available at Seagull Beach, three at Smugglers, and then there's six that are available um, to sign out at the Recreation Department. So that is something that has been accomplished. Uh, number six there is review and improve accessibility at the playgrounds, including equipment and surfaces. So maybe this might be adding some uh, handicap accessible swings and making sure that the surfaces are good to, to be able to get to those swings. Number seven, review and improve accessible parking and connections at recreation facilities. Sometimes the, the handicap parking doesn't really give you a nice route to where you want to go. So we want to make sure that that's, that's available to people. Action number eight is increasing the number of accessible picnic tables, benches, and other site furnishings. We have a lot of benches in different places that have backs on them, which are good, but they don't have arms. It would be nice to be, have some that have arms on them so people can push themselves up uh, on the benches. And we don't have um, all that many accessible picnic tables in town, believe it or not. Action item nine is consider incorporating historic uh, and educational signage, so that interpretive signage at existing facilities, and again, including that directional signage to nearby uh, act attractions and businesses. Objective 4D 
safety, maintain, enhance Yarmouth's recreational self shellfish resources. <laughs> so the first action item is continue or increase purchase of seed stock for shellfish replenishment. And number two is explore the need for and possible locations for additional town shellfish upwellers. Well, there is going to be a new educational and publicly accessible shellfish upweller in Yarmouth at Packet Landing with the Mass Oyster Project. And they're looking to install that in May. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the oyster seeds anticipated to be added in late June and early July, and they're going to actually have a, a kickoff and unveiling of a community engagement event, I believe, um, later in the fall. So that is something that would be very interesting. It would be more interactive. People can actually go up to <coughs> it and see what's going on with, with the upwellers. And the last objective uh, is expand programs and activities for all ages. So the first item there is address multi-generational needs through cooperation between the town departments. I think we already do a very good job with this between the parks, recreation, and library and the senior center. Uh, they are very interactive with the programs that they have. The second item is continue coordination with the schools for youth and adult programs, such as they had to have indoor pickleball as well as open gym basketball. Number three, um, upon completion of the Riverwalk Park, we can solicit periodic special events there to provide entertainment for our community and for our visitors. And action item four, expand recreational programming throughout the spring, summer, and winter, utilizing the schools and playing fields. In the report, there's a long list of the different programs that we currently do, and there's also a very nice list of potential future programming that might also be uh, possible in town. So what are our next steps? Uh, we're looking uh, you know, for any input that you guys might have on the Open Space and Rec plan, and we ultimately are going to need some support from you in order to uh, make our submission uh, to the Division of Conservation Services for final approval. Uh, even though we were able to get um, grants through conditional approval, we can't get all our reimbursements until we have final approval. And then, of course, keep working on all the great action items that we've identified in the Open Space and Rec plan. Sorry, it's so long. It's a very detailed plan. Well, thank you very much for a very comprehensive report. Um, is there uh, a deadline that we should keep in mind for the support letter? There, there's no particular deadline. I think, um, you know, we would, we're very close to being done, or we'd like to think we're very close to being done. Uh, and we got some good momentum, so um, we'd just like to kind of get that off off the plate there and like I say it's also the major building component for the local comprehensive plan so it'd be nice to say check that one's done so okay. it, like the next couple months well, I imagine with um, I'm going to turn this over to the board in a minute I imagine with the um, scope of the update plus the specificity of the action items this should well position you for a number of grant opportunities as they come up because it's, you know, I, I, well, selectmen do that. We meet, we have goals, and then we have action items. And it's not as easy to sort the two out as one might think. Um, you know, you might be blending objectives with goals, and uh, it, it's, you seem to be able to walk the line with the way you did it. And I commend you for that because I know that's not an easy exercise to perform. So having said that, I'm going to turn this over to Peter for questions or comments. Very, very comprehensive plan, um, very well put together, and thank you very much. And, and uh, I use a lot of the recreation stuff in the town, and I very much appreciate, appreciate them. Um, the signage is an excellent idea, and also it would be nice if the signage and the maps could link to things like the phones and the Internet. And, and our and our town website. Again, thank you very much. A, a, a great presentation. Thank you, Peter. Dorcas. There was a lot of work that went into this, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, excellent job. Excellent job. Thank you. Uh, very very comprehensive, detailed. Not only do you have your goals, you have your objectives, and you even have the action items. You've really, and as you've pointed out, um, some of them have already been completed. One thing you didn't point out that was in the report that I just have to bring up is, um, with kind of a question mark, is glow-in-the-dark paint for the pickleball courts? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that was suggested. <laughs> mm -hmm. So would there be glow-in-the-dark um, balls to go along with the... Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> she's the pickleballer of our group. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. They need lights first before they get going to start paying. But it was incredibly um, detailed, and I think it will be a great resource material for us. There's a lot of in-depth information in there. So thank you very much. I support it completely. Dan. I'm exhausted just listening to this. <laughs> I mean, so comprehensive quick. doesn't even begin to give justice the work that has been done here. Um, you know, I was so pleased to see the multiple departments that you've involved in this, the multiple staff, and just as importantly, the multiple committees in the town. You know, you have really mined every bit of knowledge in this town to make this plan so good, so full. Um, it's astounding to me, frankly. Um, I, I think the one thing that you said that caught my attention was the fact that I think there's a lot of people in town who don't know exactly how much we do have. You know, just listening to this, it boggles my mind. Um, the amount of offerings that we have for every age in this town, it's what makes Yarmouth so desirable to want to live in and to retire to. Uh, for families and for senior citizens. So I think you've done an amazing job of capturing that and putting it into a plan and making us accountable for moving forward. You know, the action items, that's exactly it. It makes us accountable because otherwise it's just a plan that you put on a shelf somewhere. Um, and it allows us to get the grant funding. So um, just deep gratitude for the exhaustive work that went into this and the work that's still ahead I'm sure to make sure that uh, these steps are are taken and that uh, the s funding sources are sought out but um, boy I I'm proud to be a Yarmouth resident after listening to this thank you I actually learned a lot about the town of Yarmouth myself. And I do have to give a shout out to the open space and rec plan committee they met diligently twice a month for seven, eight months in order to get the draft done so that we would have it in time for the park grant for the Riverwalk Park. So kudos to them for all their hard work as well as the staff. Well, kudos to you for leading us through this whole project. <laughs> and the consultant. We, we honestly have always been cognizant of that, not only the work staff does, but all of our boards and committees and commissions. We could not run town government without them. We could not do the kind of work that we are able to do without them. And um, they always have our deepest respect and appreciation for that work. Mark. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, want to uh, uh, add to the accolades of uh, my colleagues with respect to this report. Did you have any engineering consulting at all help? Y at all? Yes, we had Weston and Sampson. It was very limited. We only had $30,000, so a lot of it was done by the committee and, and staff. Yeah, I would, I would say that the, the work done by staff and by the committee uh, is of a significant value to this effort. This is something that you don't normally see done in a community for, for that kind of money. Obviously, you folks have done a lot. Um, so I would grade the report an A, but I'd like to suggest we shoot for an A plus. Uh -oh. All right. You're going to tell us how to do that. I'm going to throw in a few. I I'm going to throw in a few items that I think we should be thinking about. Um, <coughs> first of all, um, just a thought on the pickleball. I agree. I agree that there should be a lot of enthusiasm for pickleball, but I'm noticing in my travels with other towns, there's a bit of pickleball <coughs> fatigue setting in. And so we take, need to take note of it. And it's settling in in those communities where their pickleball accommodations are near residences, all right? So my recommendation is, is that if we're going to expand pickleball and try to find ways to provide more opportunities, that our priority should be on those sites that are not near residential areas, where the, the conflicts are the least in, in that noise sense. Factor. Yeah. 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 So just. I would, I would make that recommendation because I, I, I've heard complaints in other parts of the Cape. Now, I thought, being from Yarmouth, that everybody loved pickleball, but I realize that that's not the case, that uh, there, is, there are some detractors out there. So please make a note of that. Um, I'd you, like, you can do that in a footnote. Uh, they can, they're up for review. <laughs> 
Well, I, th I just think it's, while we're doing a plan, I think it's worth acknowledging. I mean, I, I, I hope the board shares a concern about making sure that we do these in areas where there are minimal conflicts, and I think that's something I want to raise. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, um, you know, I am, you know, I work for the Cape Cod Conservation District. I'm the chairman of that board. I'm heavily involved in working with federal and state agencies to bring funds, federal and state funds, to the Cape for wetlands coastal restoration. And we've been incredibly successful over the years. Money has come to Yarmouth for the Bass River work that's going on, for uh, the, the Baxter Grist Mill and the fish ladder there. We've had funds targeted to the Parker's River project. And there are other potential projects that are certainly eligible. And since this is a document that should serve as a blueprint to some degree, or at least invite and open the door for other federal and state funds, I think um, I, I would recommend expanding where you can the emphasis on the coastal and wetlands restoration, particularly with sea level rise, uh, the need to be accommodating in terms of other um, upland areas or areas that might be appropriate for restoration or enhancement in some way. Um, I'm glad we're going to town meeting talking about expanding our, our wetlands bylaws because I think um, this is something that we're just going to have to continually pay, pay more attention to. Um, the Bayview Bugs, um, as you know, that's a project that I've been heavily involved in, and I'm glad you mentioned it, but even mentioning it in the report might be a good idea, because who knows what additional funding that might bring in. Um, I know I'm committed to helping get that project off the ground, but I think there's some other funds uh, that can come in here. And there is um, the district and the NRCS actually developed a plan, and they're always looking to update it. So. Wetlands restoration projects, I would encourage you not to be shy, not to be bashful, not to skimp, um, but I'd be probably more on the more robust side because right now, I mean, we've already been able to attract, just in the program that I run, uh, over $100 million in federal funding, all right? So we were able to secure $30 million to get the Herring River restoration project off the ground in Wellfleet. That was our money that got that going and started that off and then state money came in after it. So sometimes when you have one partner stepping in and making a commitment, sometimes you'll have others tripping over themselves to participate as well. So again, this being a document that's very helpful in funding, there seems to be a fairly um, ample amount of funding for these types of projects. So I would recommend maybe beefing up the section on the coastal and wetlands restoration. Um, and also fish ladders. I, I noticed that um, we didn't identify any, and I, I would like to maybe take another pass at that, another look at that fishways. Fish, fishing, recreation is incredibly important uh, in, in Yarmouth. We have a lot of people here who come here. Uh, it's one of the values in terms of the uses of our ponds, not just for the importance of water quality and ecological integrity, but also boating and fishing. Um, I see it a lot in my neighborhood, um, but I also see it a lot in other parts of the community. Um, and again, fish ladders are projects that do get funded, so I think working with natural resources to identify other... We've got two new agreements. Yeah. Don't be shy. All I'm saying is don't be shy. That now is the time to load up, Bill, um, where you can, any other projects that are that can be identified. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, we, as you know, Mark, we have the two new agreements with NRCS for um, the fish ladder at the Long Pond Dam and um, Tom Matthews Pond, which we have a conservation easement on through the Rod and Gun Club property. So all I'm saying now is the yeah. time. We're, we're, we're the, these windows of opportunity for federal and state funding often don't last long. So now is, now is the time for us to be greedy and uh, make a full full court make make clearly identify all of the areas where even we have my potential projects i know there's been a lot of talk about the town brook area and doing more restoration work down there i would i just all i'm saying is don't be shy um the final area i want to talk about is is um golf um i watched with some degree an intense battle in the neighboring town in barnstable when developers saw an opportunity to develop a golf course into a fairly overdone housing development. Now, we know we need housing, we know we need to develop housing and affordable housing, but what made 
that particular development compelling to some and attractive to developers is that apparently the Cape Cod Commission development guidelines don't look at golf courses like we do. We see, we talk about golf on our open space plan, right? We talk about the importance of golf. We talk about the importance of that as a form of recreation. But apparently the Cape Cod Commission does not view golf the way we do and other towns do. All right, so I'm not suggesting that there are developers out there looking at our golf courses and looking at ways to entice development activity, but I do think that we need to, in the back of our minds, be cognizant that development interest in these particular parcels as land becomes scarce is high, and I would recommend that we be mindful of that and um, consider tools uh, to address potential development maybe the acquisition of, I'm not making specific suggestions to be incorporated in the report, but I think we need to be creative. You know, do we need to be thinking about development rights and acquisition of some interest in property so that at least we can maintain some, some of the conservation values that these areas represent? Because this was at the heart of the debate at the Twin Brooks development. I mean, they were essentially putting a massive housing development on a swamp that was developed in a swamp and wetlands that was converted to a golf course and then now was seen as prime development properties. So You're talking about like a deed restrictions? Something like that. Yeah, I think I'm, all I'm saying is you folks do a great job. I'm just sort of putting that out there as something to give some thought to because I am very concerned about golf courses on the Cape uh, being uh, converted uh, to developments or the attractiveness of it, because you had this beautiful golf course, Twin Brooks, and now all of a sudden we're seeing developers uh, fighting over it. And, uh, and the, again, what made it attractive is the Cape Cod Commission in terms of their development guidelines, because they don't look at golf courses like open space like we do. It, it makes the development of those areas very attractive. And so th what that means is that the, the standards for review and scrutiny are, are a lot uh, more, let's put it this way, they're very permissible. All right? Well, I know the town owns some, some properties that have deed restrictions for recreational purposes only. Perhaps we should have to look at the deeds of our golf courses and see if there are, they have deed restrictions. I think you're talking about private golf courses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't need to go into the details on that, but I think you know what I'm referring to. So. To sum it all up, I think this is an A. I have got a few suggestions, Mr. Chairman, where I think we can go to an A+. Plus. Um, I think they're very reasonable. I'd be interested in hearing any questions, comments you might have about some of the suggestions that I've presented. Christine or Kathy? If you, if you decide to adopt Mark's suggestions, I suggest that you try to do it early so we can finalize this and get our letter in. Because, you know, otherwise the committee can get discouraged, the thing can drag on, and six months later we're having an update. I think it's ready to be finalized, and I'd like to see it get finalized. Can I just add one other point? Um, the other area that I, I do think we need to pay more attention to, and I've mentioned this before, is the Mill Pond Marsh area that's north of the Bayview Bogs, that whole wetland area that is town conservation land. Uh, that is right next to the town of Barnstable's municipal water supply, right? They're pumping a significant amount of water from that area. Um, I still have a photograph when I was a kid, a postcard of the Treasure Island gift store. Does anybody have a, seen those with the moat in the front, right? Remember the old days there was a moat in the front and you can take boat rides in the back? Well, there's no water back there anymore to take boat rides. So at some point that we need to do some kind of assessment we we'll need to do some kind of analysis to find out what can be done to at least sustain or enhance some of the resources that are there. Because I think my own speculation has been that the water development, the water supply is just taking an enormous amount of water out of that entire system. But I do think it is conservation land. It should show up on some one of our maps somewhere because I don't see it in our inventory whatsoever. It, there is a very detailed um, public lands map that uh, is contained in Appendix A. Okay. What you see in here is the active conservation and recreation lands, but well, all good. of the town-owned lands, uh, except for things like town hall, you know, mm -hmm. um, are included in that in that matrix. Yeah, but I would I would make as a recommendation, if if just to consider a recommendation, is at least studying 
maybe a potential CPA-funded initiative to study and assess the ecological resources of that area. Because maybe a lot you could that reference that document yeah. and say other conservation properties that aren't included here can be found in this yep. other document. Yep. I think I did mention that under table five. Six. Was it in there? Okay. Yep. But you're right. It's very detailed in the appendix. But again, I think you did an outstanding job. I really want to commend everybody on this committee. I think you're um, fantastic, well done. Thank you so much. I agree. So, so it sounds like maybe we should take these ideas, go back to the committee, see what tweaks we want to make, and then maybe could we just come back through a consent agenda, or would you want to see us again? Consent agenda would be fine. Okay. That'd that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. The next time we're going to ask for a lot more money. We are ready for a water waste, waste water, water waste, water waste, waste water update. Jeff and Larry are going to do that. Did you notice in your packet you got a waste of water thing, Matt? Did you see it on Zoom? Did, that the did. Last one did you see it? I just saw it here. Yeah. It wasn't in the other packet. Yeah, I mean, you, gotta, oh, you need a magnifying glass, but at least it's a start. Really? Yeah, a little more waste than you ever is that made? Control yeah, it. Does that control it? He's leaving. My rope. He's leaving. So I'm assuming this was Bill Benetti that did this, right? Hey, Bob, on the time waste to go to the Mr. Chair, I think we're ready. I think you got some info for us on the state of the wastewater. Yes, absolutely. We're continuing a theme of water quality from the last couple of uh, agenda items. Uh, my name is Jeff Colby, the Public Works Director. I'm joined here by Lori Rizala, our Water and Wastewater Superintendent. And we'd like to give you some information with regard to our very active wastewater program. Uh, just an overview of what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about uh, the water resource recovery facility. You heard about that in a previous uh, topic tonight already, at least that it's under, uh, it's in process. And then we'll talk about the collection system contracts two through six. And then the groundwater discharge permit, which we've been having regular discussions with DEP on, and there's a lot of interest around that topic. And then our communications plan that's continued to uh, evolve when we've built upon that. We have some information to share with you about that uh, program. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, for those that uh, might not know what's going on with our uh, wastewater program currently. The six contracts I just referenced in the overview are shown on the slide that you have on your screen. Uh, contract one being the uh, water resource recovery facility. We'll go into some detail about that. That's the, the treatment component. And then there's the six contracts that are, uh, five contracts that are collection system related that are shown in colors on this slide here, just for background purposes. So contract number one, I'll, I'll turn this over to, to Lori to kind of walk uh, the board through the various contracts and the status of those. Okay, so contract number one is the water resource recovery facility, which has been in a bit of a holding pattern since November um, when the plans were um, completed for the, for the treatment plant um, as we wait for um, approval from the state to bid, to give us the, the permission to advertise. Um, Jeff can talk more about that part later. But um, so we do, at Did you say we're going to come back to that? Yes. The delays and how those are getting addressed. Okay. Yes, yeah, underground water discharge. <laughs> we'll talk about um, that. But um, we have gone, we've started the process again. We do hope to bid it at the end of May. So to do that, we've re put out our RFP for prequals. So that's available now. That We have a lot of people interested, and in, um, we did it once before. So um, we've been able to contact all those companies that did the pre-call before and we'll hopefully get bids on all of those um, in due May 3rd. Um, and then those people who submit that will be allowed to bid on the actual treatment plant. Um, so, I'll just go to the next slide. 
Um, this is just um, the layout of the treatment plant. So the building on the left is the water, current water department. Uh, so this whole facility will be in that field that's behind the water department. Um, the, the hashed area is the sequencing, sequencing batch reactors, which is where the real treatment takes place. They're big tanks um, where most of the wastewater treatment takes place. The building right next to that is the process building that will house some offices and as well as, you know, maintenance shop. Um, it has the blower room and different um, aspects that will help with the sequencing batch reactors. Um, and then at the end of the treatment process is the denitrification and then UV, fil UV um, for disinfection. Back up closer to the water department is the headworks building, which is where the sewage, the raw sewage comes in and gets an initial treatment. And then it'll go over to the sequencing batch reactors. And then the sludge um, comes back to the building next to headworks. So there's several buildings on the site. Um, this plan hasn't changed since the last time we were here. Um, and actually, I forgot to mention the final is those four squares to the right is where the effluent uh, drying beds are. So that's where the groundwater is just, it's discharged back into the groundwater. Um, the next slide is just um, a 3D view of the process building at the top, those bat sequencing batch reactors, uh, as well as the denitrification building at the bottom there. Mr. Chairman, I have a question just on this that's slide. Um, is there going to be the ability at a treatment plant like this um, to deal with PFAS, or is that something that we need to deal with on the front end with our water supply, principally? I guess what I'm getting at is, is we're getting reports that PFAS-laced sludge is being sort of difficult to dispose of in a number of states. And so communities are wrestling with what to do with sludge that has PFAS in it and are, are having challenges finding places. So I'm just curious, in the design of our plan, are we prepared? Is that a design issue? Or is that something that we need to deal with in the design? Or is that something that we deal with in some other process or in some other way? That's a great question. That is something that we have a space on the site to deal with, and that's up in this area here. Whereabouts, Joe? Right here. This is just open space okay, currently. I see. It's not part of the current design. Right. But as part of our groundwater discharge discussions, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a future slide, uh, there is the potential to have to add some treatment components to that. PFAS is one, total organic, organic carbon may be another, uh, advanced uh, disinfection may be another, and there is plenty of room on the site for that to happen up in this area. It's not part of the current design, uh, but if we are pushed in that direction, we have the ability to do that in the future. That's great. Thank you. Um, so moving on to contracts two and three, we have broken ground um, both ceremoniously and in, in actual uh, construction. Um, that picture there is the first manhole of the Yarmouth Wastewater Collection System. Um, it was installed on South Shore Drive. Uh, Bob in the hole. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Are there namings on the holes? The manholes are we naming? It's usually them? right at the rights? forefront of things. Yeah. Any, any one of you could claim a manhole. Um, the second manhole has been installed on Route 28, so um, we're making progress. Uh, so we can go to the next one. Um, so contracts two and three um, are underway. Um, we have contract two is the contractor is Robert Biauer. Um, you can see the current value of the project. We started the project with a change order due to the delays on both projects. So you can see what our current contract values are and they both are scheduled to be complete in 2026. So contract two, just as a review, is um, Route 28 and Old Main Street. So the section of Route 28 that is in between Old Main Street uh, for the most part, not quite getting to the Bass River intersection. Um, contract three is Route 28 from the Parker's River Bridge to um, about Skull Island is probably the easiest landmark, um, as well as South Shore Drive and Seaview Ave. Um, and one thing I just wanted to touch base on is the traffic. Um, so, so far, the only closures on Route 28 has been one lane alternating traffic for the contract three, which is near Parker's River Bridge. Um, starting tomorrow, 
Robert Hour is going to be closing the road to do their work on Route 28. Uh, so that is from Old Main Street to Forest Road. It's going to be completely closed. Um, so uh, traffic will be detoured around those areas. Uh, the Contract 3 location doesn't have a good detour, so they are, have to maintain a one, one lane of traffic. But all Route 28, all of Route 28 needs to be reopened by 5 p.m. every day. Um, and all of our uh, road closures are updated in Waze, so that if people are traveling through Yarmouth, they probably just want to turn on Waze um, when they're, wherever they're going, even if they know where, where they're going, just to know the best route. What's it called again? Waze. W-A-Y-S. W-A-Z-E. -E. Yeah, it's owned by... W-A-Z-E. -E. Yeah, it's owned by Google. how many people in the audience know what I was doing. <laughs> It's owned by Google, so if you use Google, you'll get the same information. Are we, are we using that in our communications to get word out to people, tell them to use Waze? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. Before you leave that slide, Mr. Chairman, just a quick question. Uh, I, I, I very much appreciate you putting the, the dollar figures on this because it's important for people to see just how significant these commitments are. Um, question for you, Laurie and Jeff, is uh, with respect to the engineering estimates, how, how close are the engineering estimates, have they been with the actual bid prices? Uh, both of these for contracts two and three were approximately 10 to 20 percent over the engineer's estimates. We did make some adjustments in the overall project, uh, so we know that we have $207 million been approved for phase one. So we made some adjustments in the overall project to accommodate that for contracts two and three. As we bid out the other contracts, we'll have to see if the engineer's estimates are solid or closer to the estimates or if we'll have to continue to make adjustments. Does it raise any red flags as far as you're concerned in terms of the estimating and the uh, the bid the bids is there I think it's an that's a very good question. I think it's an environment that we're in. Every every community that I talked with is is in the same situation that uh, cost escalations have continued and are continuing maybe not at the same pace that a year or two ago we were seeing, but they're still significant, especially when you talk about uh, contracts that are 18 or 19 or 20 million dollars. Uh, just a 3% uh, change is a significant number. So they are numbers that we're trying to get a better handle on, but we're seeing that uh, across the board, other communities are dealing with the same issues when they open. We're not bids. alone in terms of what's happening on the, on the estimating. Is, is there too much work going on? Is that what it is, a supply and demand situation where contractors are in a more advantageous position these days then I think that's a component that's a to component. that uh, but we're seeing even uh, issues related to the supplies and so not just the labor but the pipes and the stone and uh, pavement costs those have all been mm -hmm. continuing to increase so we're not we're not really concerned about the quality of the estimating that goes into preparing these projects uh, as we uh, get more information in, the estimating will get better. Uh, you know, some of these estimates are from a year or two ago, and prices have not uh, stabilized as much as we'd like to see, but it's something we'll continue to work with. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to contract four. That is the contract that's right at the Bass River Bridge at that intersection. Uh, we originally had hoped to do that with Mass DOT, but they have been delayed, so we are moving forward with just the sewer portion of that project on our own. We did receive approval from DEP to um, advertise the project, so we hope to have that out to bid in the next month or so. Um, and that's just a small project at, at the intersection. The water work that we want to do with that, just as an aside, we'll leave with a Mass DOT project to be able to realize those savings. Um, with Mass DOT's project. For contracts five and six, this is the two contracts that are west of Parker's River, um, five being Parker's River to Higgins Coral Road and six Higgins Coral Road to the Barnesville Town Line. Um, those two, uh, that they're also a Mass DOT project going on there, but that's not until the 2028 20, tip. So once again, too late for us. So we'll have to move forward with those um, on our own. Um, they are mostly designed, these were the projects that had been previously designed back 10 years ago, so there's not too, too much to do there. Um, we do have to work on the easement for one of the pump stations, um, and the, um, there will be a pump station at the Riverwalk Park um, that luckily we've already had some permitting done, but there may be some redesign going on with that as well. 
Um, so so those... if, if we were going to add a year or so, I mean, what do you think the cost increase implications are of the delays? Uh, we're seeing, continuing to see three plus percent increase per year. So that's there, and then now we're seeing the, what you said, 15 and to 20? Then some of our projections go as high as five. Uh, from a year-to-year -year basis, I don't think we estimate it as high as five, but I think we saw some real numbers that were five to six percent increases per year. Uh, but currently, we're expecting that um, construction increases are still in the three percent range. range. It has stabilized a little bit, but even three percent is a is a big number on these types of projects. Three percent on a big number is a big number. Yes. So if you were putting a number, a dollar figure to the big number and the year delay, what are we talking about for the for for uh, a year delay? I would say that uh, we're looking on the overall project. Uh, that our cost impacts are uh, potentially as much as a million dollars a month. Wow. So oh. I guess it would be 10 to 12 million on a year's delay. Wow. That's incredible. Total? Total for the full $207 million project, yes. Mm. So we can write a bill to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you think? <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Direct that to you. Maybe we should. <laughs> so those two projects, um, we still need authorization to bid those, um, but we do need to have them. Five and six, you mean? Yep. We, we still need to have those uh, awarded by October 31st, which is an extended deadline for SRF, assuming we get the extension. Um, so those do need to be bid in, um, you know, this summer um, in order to continue receiving the SRF funding. Is the SRF funding in jeopardy? We still if, sort if, of on the on the edge. Well, if we don't make the deadline, it is. But in our discussions, and this is probably a good spot to transition okay. our discussions, the groundwater discharge permit. Uh, DEP is well aware of our deadlines. We meet with them every two weeks. We've talked uh, that through with them. I'll let them know that May 29th for an advertisement date for. Uh, the water resource recovery facility, the treatment uh, facility contract one, uh, is a date that we have to make in order to protect that SRF funding. Uh, they're well aware of that. They've indicated they'll work with us to, to make that happen. As of uh, this week, we still don't have, uh, as of today in discussions, we still don't have authorization to advertise or permission to advertise for that, but I believe we're getting closer with every one of our meetings and discussions with them. Uh, what I will draw your attention to, just to kind of cover some of the... Jeff, what, sure. what do they have to be satisfied with to give you permission to advertise? What's, what's the hold-up uh, issue there? Uh, the, currently, the most significant component is uh, potential to impact wetlands. That's what their uh, major concern is. It has been um, for most of our meetings. Thing. Exactly. It's the groundwater mounding where the discharge happens and that potential in the, um, the highest discharge periods for that to have a mound that could potentially travel and impact wetlands. As uh, you're probably well aware, the 99 Buck Island Road site has cranberry bogs, uh, mostly abandoned cranberry bogs, but some active uh, towards the west as well as the north, uh, but mostly abandoned cranberry bogs to the east and the south. And those are the areas that they're concerned about uh, making sure we don't have any negative impacts too. Uh, we've done a significant amount of modeling uh, through our consultant team, which is CDM Smith. Wright Pierce is our owner's project manager. Uh, the other item I wanted to highlight on here is, uh, is just Horsley Witten, uh, which is this last bullet, has been added to our team uh, to analyze that uh, potential impact you mentioned wetlands. that before. And, yeah. and they've been very helpful in our discussions. That's the farm from Sandwich. Absolutely, right. They're well respected with regards to wetland um, delineation and impacts and how resistant different species within the wetland community, community is to those uh, potential changes and fluctuations in, in water table. And it is important to note that we're really talking about a water table that is only in the highest flow periods and for a limited period of time. Uh, but as we've mentioned all along, this is DP is a very conservative group, and so they kind of take that highest level and ask us to analyze 
that highest mounding level as what that impact might be. So bringing that uh, environmental consultant firm on board has been a huge help in our discussions Good. with Good. DEP. Thank you. Uh, so what I do want to say is um, you've seen some of these updates on this uh, groundwater discharge permit, the first three or four, but I'd like to uh, draw your attention to just the discussions we've been having about alternative discharge locations. So what's become clear is that 99 Buck Island Road uh, is our primary discharge location as it has been all along, uh, but we do need to seek other sites uh, in our next best site is the Bay Bear Hills Golf Course. And we've been having regular discussions with our team as well as uh, Scott Gilmore here about the use of treated effluent at that uh, facility and that has some great promise to it. But again, it has the uh, analysis that needs to be done associated with it to see that there's no impacts, negative impacts to wetlands that are in that area as well. So we're being, uh, we're needing to look at that for just phase one. We, we knew that we'd need alternative sites in our you know, big eight phase program at some point. Uh, but what we're seeing with these discussions with DEP is the need to look at other sites even for just our phase one flows. Uh, between 99 Buck Island Road and that Bayberry Hills Golf Course are very promising to handle most of the flows as long as we can uh, justify those no negative impacts to wetlands in those areas and, to, and meet um, DEP's, address DEP's concerns about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, another up update that I want to bring to the board's attention is uh, since last time we were before you, uh, we filed a notice of intent with the Conservation Commission uh, to get them involved and bring them to the table and have their input as to the impact to wetlands issue. Uh, and they were very receptive to our first meeting. Uh, we've continued that uh, meeting uh, in order to get an order of conditions from that process until May 2nd. So May 2nd, we will be meeting again with the Conservation Commission here uh, locally in Yarmouth to get their support for a adaptive management plan for 99 Buck Island Road, uh, which is just a series of monitor wells and uh, other delineations and um, uh, both for groundwater as well as surface water elevations and uh, plant community monitoring, part of our adaptive management plan, uh, monitoring plan that we're looking to get their approval on so that we can uh, satisfy DEP with regards to that wetlands. It, the way DEP is structured is they are very reliant on the local commission, the local um, representation in order to uh, permit things such as construction or in this particular case, uh, groundwater impacts. I mentioned Horsley Witten already. Uh, and the last um, exciting piece of news that I want to uh, mention to the board is I had mentioned that we'd applied for a nitrogen sensitive area grant previously, but we were just notified by DEP that we received that. So we're getting $70,000 from the Commonwealth uh, to continue this analysis uh, with regards to uh, the groundwater discharge permit, as well as some uh, preliminary work with our watershed permit. So they've brought some funds to the table for us to continue this work. Uh, and we are happy to receive that. So those are the highlights with regards to groundwater discharge. Uh, I did want to mention, I think you, you heard from uh, the town administrator previously, uh, another encouraging piece of our discussions is that they are starting to draft the groundwater discharge permit. So we know that they're working on that. Uh, they're just not ready to release that to us. But uh, each one of our discussions, uh, I truly believe, is bringing us closer to actually getting that permit issued. Only. Is there any questions or comments or thoughts on that before Are we questions or comments? leave no. this slide? Yeah. Just on the, uh, the Bayberry Hills um, s second site, do plans, engineering, all of that need to be developed for phase one in order to incorporate that? Or how does that work? Because that wasn't initially part of the uh, phase one. Good question. The short answer is yes. We need to de develop plans with regards to where that water gets used. Is it just simply put in an irrigation pond that then gets spread uh, on the golf course through the regular process that we do with the current treated water from the septage facility and irrigate the, the course? Uh, or is there some type of um, subsurface component uh, that needs to occur in order just to infiltrate the large volume of water we expect to have to um, discharge? And it's probably a combination of both. But the short answer is that, yes, we need to continue to develop plans. Uh, 
we've been very uh, active in, in keeping um, the golf department in, uh, aware, at least as much aware of the uh, developments as we are. And they are currently dealing with a project to uh, increase the size of a transmission main for the reclaimed water. So that will be helpful in, in our process. Uh, but the bottom line is we're still working through what all those requirements will be with DEP. So we don't have all of the parameters, if you will. But once we know those parameters, we will have to do some additional design. Okay. I, I have a follow-up on your question. I mean, if it's okay. Um, what's the likely cost of an additional facility to handle and, you know, this 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 now this new discharge location I, it's not going to be cheap right it's not going to be cheap but i don't think we can venture a guess as to what that might be and my hope certainly is we'll be able to use as much as possible for irrigation purposes and not have to build significant infiltration uh, at the golf course but we just don't know that yet we just don't know that but that's something i think in the next update or at least at, at the appropriate time. I, th I think that's information we definitely want to. What I'm concerned about, Mr. Chairman, is that between the delays caused by the state, between what's happening in the industry in terms of cost increases, and then these add-ons that are coming in forced on us by the state because for whatever reason they didn't look at these issues the first time around when they looked at our plans and approved them, now we're having to deal with this. That, you know, after a while this all adds up. And the reality is, is that um, no one's giving us any extra money for any of this stuff. This is just additional dollars that we, as a community, are going to be on the hook on. And I think, I mean, I think that's a topic that we need to discuss, you know, at a future meeting is, is accounting for some of these add-ons and then figuring out. Uh, we'll need to explain, I think, to the voters, you know, how this is impacting the project because Obviously, there are adjustments that are being made in the project in order to make things happen. So um, areas that we wanted to sewer, I would assume, are not going to be sewered or we're not going to be collecting sewage from certain areas in order to... So that some of these areas are getting changed and modified. Now, we haven't even had the time to even talk about those modifications and what we've done to fall in. But at some point, I'm sure at a future meeting, we can get those particular items on the table to see how the dimensions of the project have changed. Um, but what's happening in terms of financing is significant. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we need to continue to be abreast of. I appreciate the, the briefing today, but the costs um, are, are clearly significant and something that we need to be very mindful of. There's not much we can do. We're sort of, uh, as a former selectman, Bud Goscroft said, you know, that you know, we've got, you know, almost a gun to our head, so to speak. I'm not going to bring out a gun or anything. <laughs> Please don't. But, no, the point is, is that we're under a lot of pressure. And, um, and you know, I, com I commend you for, uh, and our team, our entire team, for, you know, just being aggressive on this stuff. This is a very, very difficult job, and I think you folks are doing an incredible, you're, you're doing incredible work on behalf of the town, so... I want to thank you for that, but uh, I do want to revisit some of the added costs later on and how the project has changed in terms of its scope, in terms of aspects of it, because at some point we're going to have to revisit that, right? Yes, absolutely. We have restructured some of the contracts to add uh, alternates so that those alternates could be removed if the bids came in high. Uh, we've done that actually with the uh, resource recovery facility. We have some alternates that are in that bid when we do get permission to advertise and go out to bid that the plans and specifications are completely done on that. But we've structured it so that in case there are um, unexpected um, high bids, we could you know pull some things out. Um, not ideal, uh, but they are components that we could uh, deal with at a later point if we needed to. Uh, same thing with the collection system. There's certain areas or, or streets that could be uh, you know, put on hold at this point while we build the backbone of the system. Uh, again, we'd like to get you know, the entirety of that phase one area done, but uh, if we um, have to you know, make some modifications to get most of it done, that's you know, what we've been doing so far. And, uh, we really don't know what the next piece is to um, significantly modify the plan until we get that treatment facility 
out to bid and get the numbers in for that. That's more than 50% of the overall cost, and we can't just keep uh, doing small pieces of the collection system until we know what the real elephant in the room is, if you will, of the treatment plant cost. So that's really what we're pushing hard to get the permits to get out to bid on that, because once we have the big piece of the puzzle, then the smaller pieces, excuse me, the smaller pieces will then be able to know where they fit. Jeff, if, if just a hypothetical question, I don't know if you can even answer it, but if on the shakeout of all these phase one contracts, they exceeded the funding of the 207 million SRF funding, would the state still fund up to that amount or would they require you first to show that you can get that other money by an appropriation or some other measure? We'd still need to make an appropriation at the local level, but there is the process within the SRF program to amend um, costs, if you will. And we've yeah. seen that in other communities. They've come in with a you know, $25 million request that ended up after they went out to bid being $30 million. So there is a process, there is a process to amend uh, the requests and okay. it, um, you know, we just need to go through that, that process. Uh, again, that would mean needing a local appropriation and permission to do that. Uh, but there is a, a way to adjust those. It's uh, not ideal, but there is a process in place to make adjustments based on cost increases. Well, hopefully that won't happen, but... Right, we don't know yet. But we'll, once we get some more uh, of the contracts bid out, on we will. On toilet uncertainty. Right, right. Well, if there's no other comments on this, we do want to um, highlight. Uh, before we go on the on the permit, are we reasonably? I mean, Bob and you have been cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to get through this. Has anything changed, Bob? Bob did you want to add anything? In no, I, I think you know uh, Jeff um, has presented it um, extremely well. Um, I have also been in on every single one of these meetings. We've I know been you have. That's why I asked you the question. It was October, and, you know, um, it is a little vexing dealing with the DEP on this issue. We go to these meetings. There's 16, 17 participants. DEP alone has um, six or seven of those, and, you know, each one seems to be empowered to bring up whatever issues that, that they would like, and, and it almost seems that there has to be, like, a 100% consensus on their part to move everything forward, and, and that's never the case. This will never be a perfect project, but, you know, I, I would say, in my humble opinion, the issue of, um, you know, using the discharge of this effluent, right, that has already been removed from the water table as water, right, through our pumping wells, to restore that to the aquifer, to call that an alteration of the wetland, I, I think is a stretch of the Wetlands Act. Um, and, you know, normally these alterations of a wetland are from um, encroaching on the wetland, developing in a wetland, um, filling wetlands. In, in this case, we're really restoring the wetlands. So we do have a, a little bit of a sense of frustration, but I think that with Horsley and Witten on the team now and some of the work that Wright Pierce is doing, uh, it's, it's really becoming clear that the um, impacts to the wetlands are not so detrimental as it was initially posited by the DEP. The um, specific habitats are not the type of endangered species habitats that are at any uh, risk whatsoever. So the farther we go along the technical route, the more it becomes clear that from a scientific basis that there does not seem to be um, alarm with respect to, to handling of, of, of those wetlands with, with this discharge. Now, the points of the capacity, and I mean, that, that's a, a very critical point. The lower the capacity that they're going to give us, the more money we have to spend developing new sites, and, and, and that is going to be um, a problem. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the key point, and, and we've discussed this, I, I think, in extreme detail, and we've been very aggressive on this, is that um, they are acutely aware that we have a deadline that we've worked back from where we need to make that contract to, to put the 
project out out to bid and um, you know to, today we review that in exceeding detail so um, they've indicated they're going to do everything that they can to get us on that date and we're going to we're going to push for that and you know we've um, had you know the governor's office helping us we've had uh, you know some of the DEP Boston people helping us but um, you know they want to let that process for these analyses of these wetlands um, move along and and not have it interrupted by, by our side but I, I will say this is that this entire issue you know we've committed to this collaborative process and we're going to continue to stick with it but they it they do not have a methodology that will completely end this with at, at a finite level um, and you know by by May 29 that there will be ongoing analysis and adaptive management program that needs it's going to extend far beyond so um, a lot of what we need is uh, some type of faith on behalf of the DEP that this project should move forward because um, after after the next um, you know month and a half you know it'll be basically you know canceling the project if they don't allow us to move forward so uh, based on everything that they've told us we feel they're going to let us put it out to bid but um, they're never going to be 100 percent happy with with the level of the detail because the data does not exist you know to um to provide a complete 100 percent guarantee doesn't the Wetlands Protection Act really address more incursions into wetlands from other areas as opposed to taking water out of these areas and returning them with much lower nitrogen content? I mean, I don't see how you can consider that an incursion into a wetland area. It seems to me that it's an improvement of a wetland area. Well, and, the, and that's our position, that, that what we're doing is improving the overall water quality and improving the health of wetlands. Uh, we just need to convince DEP of that. Yeah, I, I don't see the logic of what their position is. I just don't. No, and it's, it's frustrating because um, uh, sometimes you hear things, you know, when, when we address specifically, right, the lowering of the water table, from the pumping to the water supply wells, you know, um, again, it's not DEP, it's this um, group of scientists. You know, they, they, everyone gets to say whatever they want, and, and they, you know, and one of them will say, well, you know, uh, it, it's been drained for so long that uh, if, if you restore it, that, that will alter it. And, and so, you know, it's kind of, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Either you're restoring it, or you're going to try to protect this uh, depleted state, and but but we feel that the science is on our side, and um, our team at Horsley Edwin has been real clear on this, and so we're hoping that cooler heads will prevail. But um, and the, don't they and, and when they and, and do the analysis, don't, aren't they losing sight of the big picture as to where are we without the remediation? Oh no, it's worse than that. The starting They're, point, right? They're risking the entire environment of the Cape. Right, if we're prevented from doing this project because it's not, you know, 1,000% perfect on, um, you know, what happens in, in every single groundwater analysis, that means you're throwing out all of that environmental improvement. Well, the problem with the Cape has always been there's water wherever you turn. I mean... That's the Cape. That's the hydrogeology of the Cape. Yeah. That's our challenge, yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right, so we want to highlight for you as well, and this is the last slide we have. I don't know if you can advance that. It's not advancing on this. Is the communications plan. It's so important as we move forward, especially getting into construction impacting roadways. Uh, this is critical that we continue to build on our uh, communications plan. We've had regular meetings with uh, 
Paul Chaffee and Lori Sullivan with regards to how we can improve this and enhance this information, uh, both putting out uh, social media posts as well as enhancing our wastewater construction uh, website, webpage. Uh, we have detour information up there. We've got construction plans. We uh, have just recently uh, added a page for resident information about what uh, the con connection might look like for you, commonly asked questions, uh, things of that nature. Um, and as we mentioned before, updating Waze daily, certainly that Waze app is a great way to communicate how it's best to get around uh, the, tr the, the impact with regard to the construction, which your best way through uh, the community or to arrive at any specific destination. So what we wanted to highlight for you, and, and Lori is uh, going to walk us through uh, this, is where you can find some of this information on our website. Uh, that is the, the town website. I'm sure you recognize that on the screen. And wastewater construction is front and center up on that uh, on that title bar. Uh, we also have um, the three-week look-ahead schedules for both of the active construction projects, contracts two and three, that are ongoing. So if people want to see, you know, where are they working this week? What specifically are they doing? What do the next uh, two weeks look like? That's on here and gets updated every time there's a new three-week look ahead of exactly where they're working. And construction is very dynamic, and so that does change on a regular basis, and we put that on uh, the website uh, as soon as we get that. So weekly it's changing uh, with what is the real information currently happening and what is the expected locations for the next two weeks ahead. Does the weather impact that at all? Absolutely. So there's been days already that it, it was raining and we had to take the days off, but we were unable to, to work those days. Uh, so there's, it's very dynamic. That's a ex uh, perfect example of why it regularly changes, but we want to get the information out to the to people, to the public, uh, as best we can with those changes. Is there anything else you want to yeah, just, highlight on this, Lori? created this resident information page, which is four of the most frequently asked questions that we get at our office. You might need this. Anyone can hear me? Does this work? Yes. Um, so these are the top questions that we get at our office, which are probably the questions that anyone else that's associated with the town gets, the Board of Health, whoever it is. Um, so we have some answers here uh, for the questions, but we also have the number one question I think most people ask is what phase am I in? Um, so we set up this pretty easy to use web page where you can just, um, let me turn on the, there's the legend and you can throw in your address um, and it'll bring you to it. And you can easily see what phase you're in. So first question answered, um, and hope just want to get that out there. Um, may save a few phone calls to the office, so people are welcome to call. Um, but um, usually that's an easy question, and they're in, in the explanation it does describe that it's a 40-year plan. Each phase is four, four, five years, so if you're phase five, you know, you're, you're 25 years out, and that might just, people, a lot of people are like, all right, I don't care anymore. So they, they don't have to, you know, they don't worry about the details after that. There's a little that. picture of the five times table in there. <laughs> yeah. We don't have that. That's something we could add. Um, so I just wanted to let people know that that's, that resource is there, and um, the basic questions of, um, you know, do I have to connect? How much is it going to cost me? And, um, and then some more information at the bottom, uh, the water department number and our wastewater email if people have more questions. So just that's a resource for any of you who got questions. You can send them to this page, at least as a place to start. And then they can call our office if they have more questions. So, yeah. so I think that's all we have for an update. Happy to answer any questions that you still might have. Mike. Yeah, has a question. Jeff, you mentioned um, that part of 28 is going to be closed. Um, can you tell us for how long and what's the impact to the businesses along that stretch? Well, that area that is impacted is currently in the Robert Auer contract, and they assure everyone, they've gone door to door with the businesses in that area, that you will be able to get there, your um, uh, employees will be able to get there. Your customers will be able to get there. So when we say closed, it means to through traffic. Uh, okay. There is an easy detour around that particular area if you're going from Dennis to Barnstable or some other, you know, West Yarmouth, let's say. Uh, so it's an easy detour to get around, which is why that area was um, 
needed to be closed. Also, the road's very narrow and they're digging very deep. So it's a little bit of a safety issue. If you wanted uh, to well. get to one of the businesses in particular. To get to one of the businesses, there are uh, detail officers as well as uh, construction uh, inspectors okay. that will easily get you into where you need to go and tell you in, in the best way to get there within that zone. So uh, while it's closed to through traffic, it's open to local traffic, let's say. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No, I very much appreciate the update. Well, thank you well, for the update. Obviously, this is very important information, not only for us and, and um, the public. I'm glad you're also going to be addressing this by way of the website, give people as much information as we can give them on an ongoing basis. And I want to commend all of you for the, uh, your persistence and your hard work in dealing with DEP. I'm sure that's no delight, something that you wake up for. Looking forward to it in the morning, but stay on them. And, uh, you know, we fully support what you're doing and uh, look forward to getting a resolution to this, getting those contracts awarded. Yes, absolutely. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is... Uh, meeting preview, but what I'd like to do, Bob, what I'd like to do before we do that, only because we had somebody interested in it tonight, let's do that brief update on um, migrants, and then we could spend the, pretty much the rest of the allocated time on a town meeting without worrying about running out of time. Dorcas has some appointments. Well, maybe we can do those, too. Okay. So let's do this. Let's, if it's okay with the board, let's yeah. do the title minute up straight. We'll do Dorcas's um, work. We'll do the consent agenda. We'll, um, we'll skip everything else and then go back and spend whatever time remains or you wish to spend on um, town meeting. How's that? So, Bob, you're on for um, yes. town administrator updates. Under my town administrator update, I want to... Uh, Brief the board. Uh, I, I know members have, have seen the correspondence, but we received uh, correspondence from <coughs> Tyler Newhall, who is the Director of Municipal Relations at the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. That is the program that has been responsible for operating the migrant housing uh, here in our community. And um, <coughs> he reports that in the interest of consolidating the unstaffed shelter sites, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities wanted this group to be aware of plans to transfer all 39 families out of the Yarmouth Harborside Suites on Tuesday, April 23, and Thursday, April 25, 2024. The families will be transferred into various shelters all staffed by emergency assistance shelter provider agencies, and we will share more information on the destinations of specific families as we get closer to the transfer dates. State agency staff will inform families of the moves today. Colleagues from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will also be in touch with the school districts to share details on the families to be transferred and determine logistics for continued education of school-aged children. Please feel, feel free to contact me directly should you have any questions. And subsequent to receiving this email, we received a telephone call from the governor's office that confirmed all of this information and said that it, it was true and, and it was happening. So um, we've tried to get this up on the town's website. I know we've received a lot of questions and, and concerns, and that's the updated status as of today. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Dorcas, you're up for board and committee actions. Okay, we ha um, have received a letter of resignation from Dennis Lucier uh, for his position on the Yarmouth Recreation Commission, and I move that we accept his uh, resignation with our thanks for his uh, years of service. Second. Any, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously, 401 member absent. And I move to appoint Margaret Mullover as a 
regular member of the Recreation Commission. This appointment is to fill the unexpired term, which will run through July of 2025. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes by unanimous vote of 401. Member absent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Dorcas. Okay, now we're going to go to the town meeting preview. Bob, you want to explain briefly the um, format of what we're going to be doing here tonight? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, first and foremost, I, I'd like to acknowledge our, our town department heads who've worked so hard on all of the articles, the budget. It's been, you know, it's a long haul. It's, this starts in, in October, and, and it doesn't end till. April, and we try to rake them over the coals every possible chance that, that we get there, all here this evening. And I, I want to thank them. I mean, I, I know it's a very busy time of year, so uh, folks have been waiting a while. And, and, and thank you for all of your hard work. Now, uh, this is our town meeting preview, which the town meeting uh, <coughs> will be held on uh, Tuesday, April 30, 2024, at our intermediate um, regional school on Station Avenue, the new school. Uh, so we want to very much encourage all residents to um, make sure you're registered as voters and, and come out and participate in the annual town meeting um, this evening. We're here not to debate individual articles on their merits, but uh, to increase the awareness for the public. We'll hopefully show this uh, program and portions of it. Uh, you know, throughout the time period that we have between now and town meeting, we want to make sure everyone knows what is on the town meeting, what the articles are, uh, and we'll have um, any questions that, that folks have or the board has on, on any of the articles to um, try to answer questions. Just make sure folks are comfortable with the content of the town meeting so that when they come to town meeting, they'll know uh, what the issues are. Bob, can I just quickly ask, you said uh, register to vote. Can people, if they are not registered to vote in town, still be able to be registered and become and be able to vote at town meeting? Mary's going to answer that, and I think she's going to tell you no. So Mary Maslowski, town clerk, the last day to register to vote for town meeting is April 20th, uh, which is 10 days in advance of, of the town meeting. We will hold a special registration session here at town hall from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on that Saturday. So anyone who wishes to participate in town meeting and vote needs to attend, uh, needs to be registered no later than uh, 5 p.m. on that Saturday, April 20th. Um, people who are not registered voters are permitted to come in as a visitor. They're required to sit in the visitor section. And uh, as you all know, non-voters are only um, able to speak at town meeting if uh, the moderator allows a vote and the vote is actually approved. So ample time to register if you haven't already. Correct. But remember, you've got about 10 days left, so get in there and, and get registered. So there are also links on the, on the website uh, to be able to do that under the election section under the town clerk's department page. All they have to do is come to the town clerk's office. There's no... Correct. There's no specific time they have to do that. Nope. They can any time up until the... the um, 20th of April, uh, or you can do it online at the Secretary of State's website, and there's a link to that website on our town page. You can do it online, and it comes into our queue, and we register it. We'll get it the next morning. You can do that online. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And then the last key goal for this evening is that, um, you know, as you've seen in our recent town meetings, we have a fabulously detailed series of um, slides that we project at the town meeting to provide some very detailed information on the articles, on the background, to help it answer questions. Um, and, and what we'd like to do is run through that, that slide presentation this evening to orient folks toward the type of information and the presentation of information that they can depend on um, at the town meeting. Now, in, in doing that, the first and foremost, I need to acknowledge um, one William Scott, the assistant town administrator, who really does a masterful job in pulling information from every single facet of the town operations to go into this slide presentation that is uh, very, you know, 
pleasing to see but very detailed and um, he's really done a, a fabulous job with that so as we look at the articles um, Bill's going to walk us through just the slides so you'll see the slides now all of these slides and we'll be able to make tweaks and adjustments we'll have up on the big screen um, at the town meeting that will help orient the voters walking through these issues and, and our, our key thing is to eliminate you know all of the um, you know it, potential confusion, what's this about, and make sure that folks have the information that they need to act on it as our legislative body um, at the town meeting. So with that, we thought we would uh, go right through what each article is and then have uh, questions from the board. If there's any members of the public that have questions as well, um, I, I really want to give department heads a, an opportunity to uh, present their information as well. But um, Very great. It, starts off with article one and article one will be the budget adjustments for the current fiscal year we have two key areas that we do need to adjust that folks have seen in previous years the construction and demolition account uh, for uh, 100,000 from free cash as a result of the high level of volume and um, in, anytime you see that construction and demolition uh, be aware that there's revenue associated with that that goes into the general fund so it's not all cost it is an offset um, to have the the money to dispose of this equipment um, and material and also on the revenue side that that we collect funds for those and we also have on the snow and ice although we did not have a lot of snow there were um, many icing incidents and keep in mind we drastically underfund that snow and ice account because it has in the state law it's the only account that we have the ability to spend um, overspend what the appropriation is so what we do is we we keep that as long as you spent what you spent the previous year and we've kept that low because we've had you know decreasing amounts of snow uh, but this will take care of any deficits that we have in the snow and ice account and preserve our ability to potentially deficit spend in the future. So uh, the budget adjustments are Article 1. And from there, we move into Article 2. And as you can see with, with Bill, that there's an explanation of, of, of each article that has a slide associated with it. Article 2 is the omnibus municipal budget, and that goes on for... But one, two, three, four pages, and it has a total of all of the municipal operations. Um, this year, the recommendation from the Finance Committee is $49,926,894. Mm -hmm. And um, that also has um, a number of funding sources. Do you have that? I thought that was great, Bill, the slide that um, you had that showed an example of some of the transfers. I don't know if we've got that in there yet, but when you see the municipal budget, it is interesting that it, it brings in the other funding sources, not just raise and appropriate. You can see where, you know, you have funds from wetlands, um, the ferry tax, the ambulance reserve um, to fund fire department wages, PEG access, all of the various funds all go in along with the um, tax dollars to raise the municipal budget. So we're going to go through, when we get to town meeting, the various line items and have it open for any questions that folks have on the town budget. And it starts with just the municipal budget. Now what's important to note is the town's budget is split over several articles. The general fund is kind of Article 2, has a lot of the, um, the general municipal items. But when we move into Article 3, we, you can see we handle the enterprise budgets separately. Now, these are completely separated out from the general fund and are 100% run on the revenues derived from the operations. And um, there's a series of these. So the first one we'll see is the Gulf Enterprise Budget, which is Article 3. And the total there is 5,159,403. Uh, now, that is funded, as you can see, 100% from the Gulf Enterprise revenues. And so it's separated from the general fund, but it's part of the overall town budget. So we'll do a series of these articles 
that are on the budget. Article 4 is the Water Division budget, which operates similarly. It's not an official enterprise fund. It's a special revenue fund, but all of the funds that are derived from the water revenues, when folks pay their bill, are held in a separate account, and that's what funds um, both the capital and, in this instance, this is the operating budget for the water division, which comes in Article 4, and that's another 5.4 million and change, and, and Bill's got the, the detail on the slides that breaks that right down, hopefully answering a lot of the questions. And then we continue in Article 5 with the remainder of the enterprise budgets. The next one is the septage enterprise. And, and again, the town does operate its own septage treatment facility that operates completely self-sustaining as a, a separate cost center outside of the uh, town's general budget. And we also have figures uh, on these articles. And you can see it's uh, up on that chart there that uh, the balance in that account in terms of what the current surplus is, every one of these enterprise funds is, is highlighted. And in this case, the Septage Enterprise retained earnings balance right now is $4,320,985, um, which is actually greater than their annual budget, three million one two six zero four one. But that's an important number because this facility is capital intensive and, and they do have a series of capital improvements that they need to make from year to year. So it's important to have that enterprise balance. And then uh, we move into item six, which is a new enterprise fund where we um, created it, I think, two years ago. And now we're beginning to fund it for some of the um, costs that are coming in for wastewater. Wastewater will operate on its own complete enterprise budget without subsidy from the general fund. All of the wastewater um, expenses in the future will be developed once we get the plant online from the wastewater uh, enterprise revenues. And it is being funded currently from our pre-funding program. Um, as you know, we're uh, building up a surplus of approximately $10 million, which will help uh, ramp up into the debt service payments when the system is built. So these current funds are um, being, uh, these are funds that have been transferred into the wastewater enterprise budget as part of our pre-funding program. So that's uh, Article 6. And, and again, we're still on the annual town budget. And then we move into another self-sustaining area, um, which is the cable, television, and communications budget, which is funded 100% um, from the cable special revenues. These are the fees paid to the town for operating a cable television franchise through Xfinity. Uh, total funding there for the year for um, all of the local access origination programming, whether it's public, educational, government, plus the communications system in the town is 510,346. Um, again, not a drain on the general fund revenues, only the cable revenue account. And after Article 7, we move into the component of the budget for the educational costs. There's two articles on that, and the first one is Article 8, which is the Dennis Yarmouth Regional School District budget. And this relates also to the ballot question that the board approved to put on the election. And this level of appropriation uh, certified at $43,756,567 um, will be made subject to, in the motion, an override of Proposition 2.5 um, for the $880,000 um, to augment the town's um, certified school budget. So that number is inclusive of the override. And it's inclusive. Okay. How much is that number? The, um, the override is 880,000. 880? Yes. <clears throat> and, the, and the total certified budget for the school is 43,756,567. So um, you can see where we've been successful, at least in getting the number of the override down as low a 
portion of that number as we can, but, but it is um, going to be subject to that, which, you know, a little bit in terms of background um, that, um, you know, what that means is that if um, the override does not pass, we will need to return to town meeting and readdress the, uh, the exact amount that's appropriated with the plan. And, and I would say that that would be the case in any event. If, if the override does not pass, we will need to have an additional town meeting before the town is able to set its tax rate, and we will need to address that shortfall. Um, and, you know, I have been conducting meetings with our finance director, and, and we do have um, a contingency plan. Uh, it's not entirely pretty. It will involve some reductions in the, the budgets uh, that we would propose for both the school and the town um, that... You know, it's, so it's not a situation where uh, if we don't get this money that automatically only the school cuts and nobody else cuts. I, I, I think what is clear is that, you know, we're in this collaboratively. It's collectively with the school department. We have our, our shortfall because their budget, you know, had the, the increase. And, um, but, but if it doesn't pass, we will have to come back. And it will be subject to... Uh, approval of the board so I don't want to say you know we will do this amount here this amount there we, we have contingency plans in place but I, I would say it would require reductions on both sides so um, it, Bob you know, can I jump in here for a second and just once again because people tend to get confused on this is uh, my understanding is that you know some people vote no and think that that means that the school is not going to get the money but that's not the answer if, if folks vote no on, um, on the amount, the school doesn't necessarily, the school can still go forward with the, um, with the amount that they're requesting. They just turn to the town and say, you have to make up the difference. Yes. Would and that be the simplest way to say it? And it, it, if there's not collaboration on that process, it could be, it could be forced. The school doesn't have to... Um, cut their budget anymore that and and a worst case scenario would would be that all of the cuts would have to come on the town side which happened once and I think 2008 2008 and and it's it's not very pretty it, it, at that time it caused the layoff of of a number of town positions that um, you know created havoc with town services for many years after that well, I say this because just for an informed vote, I think people don't realize, they think that if they're voting no, then the school has to go back to the drawing board and, you know, cut their, um, cut their budget. But that is not true. It's not true. You, you could it's wind up true. losing police, firefighters, DPW, all the core services. Everything um, is, is at risk. So... Correct. The point. school doesn't have to cut their budget, but the town would have to cut their budget. The school doesn't have any money. All they got to do is give you an assessment. That's it. It's it's only funding Sorry, Mike, I, I, didn't, I didn't get what you just said. Could you repeat that? Yeah, I said the school doesn't pay. They don't have any money. All they do is make an assessment to the town. They don't have a budget, per se. Well, here's the question. I mean, why? why they, get it, they get the money from the municipalities. My question is, what's the what's the remedy to this? It would be for them to have their own assessing authority, right? Their own taxing authority, right? Their own taxing split. authority. Yeah, what you the property tax bill would have to be split. They would basically be on their own. Well, you'd have to. Like New Hampshire does it. Yeah, exactly. That would be the remedy. I mean, that's, I'm not You'd sure. You'd have to dissolve the district and go through all those machinations, which wouldn't be easy to do. Well, I don't know about that. It may be that just to segregate and keep the, ta the municipal tax. And don't forget, any change to that regional agreement has got to be initiated by yeah. the school district. Yeah. Okay, I'll just stop. I'll towns. stop. I'll stop there. There you go. So that's Article 8 is the Dennis Yarmouth, and I hope that that... It helps. Thank you very much, Dorcas. I hope that, that explains for folks this whole issue of the override and, and, and how it works. Um, but I, I think the feeling is if that we make the, the appropriation contingent upon the approval of the two and a half, it at least puts us all at the table to make the decisions 
because we have to go back and revote the school budget as opposed to if you don't make it contingent you don't have to do anything to the school budget and it everything would fall on the town side so what what this is designed to do is keep the collaborative process open and you know I, I could say from the town side we certainly um, you know intend to continue maintaining that strong collaborative working relationship because other than you know getting some kind of a messy divorce there um, we're, we're stuck communicating and collaborating so that's article 8 now article 9 is the end of the annual budget process it's the final article and it's a, another education article for the Cape Cod Regional Technical High School budget and um, you can see that is certified at three million nine hundred twelve thousand, which is what maybe ten percent of the the district to give you a, a sense of proportion between the size of the two um, schools with respect to the the Yarmouth certification. And after Article Nine, we move into the portion of the budget. It is still the financial articles. But now we're not in the operating budget anymore. We're in the capital budget uh, process. And it starts, and it's, it's very similar to the way it works with the budget process, that we sequester the individual cost centers. So the enterprise funds, uh, they all have their own separate articles. And then we have an omnibus article for the general capital. So it starts with Article 10 is the golf capital total of three hundred and ten thousand dollars and um, has for those um, are the projects and again it, it is taken from their retained earnings there's a, a 2.1 million dollar balance that is in there currently um, so that's adequate to support the golf capital at 310 and then we move into article 11 which is similar to, again, that we did with the annual budget. It's the water division capital expense, totaling 860000 And again, there is $1,801,000 in their balance uh, as of July 1. And um, that is, is all of the capital for water. And then, again, just like we saw the septage budget we see the septage division capital expense and we mentioned earlier that it's a very capital intensive program operating that wastewater treatment facility but it's good to see they have septage odor control um, some tank rehab and a, a new loader totaling a million for all of their capital to keep that facility operating strong and after that we move into some special project authorizations there's two articles that go hand in hand um, article 13 is a massachusetts public library grant authorization to allow the town to apply to the mass board of library commissioners for a grant to help the community study and develop plans for a potential library improvement program and they have a construction project to help walk us through those and um, there's a great deal of information I, I know that at our last meeting we met with the consultants to review the detail of that project and um, hopefully at town meeting we'll get a chance to update folks on the the detailed study and the library needs that have been identified and uh, in participating in that grant there is also a local match and in article 14 we seek to take the local match of 150,000 transferred from free cash and that is the town's share of that grant for the feasibility study on library improvements so 13 and 14 go hand in hand first authorizing the grant application and the second authorizing the town's local match for that uh, process and we move again staying with the town capital needs um, we have article 15 is the <coughs> next round of police cruiser financing which we developed that 10-year program now that um, replaces all of the police cruisers through leases when they need 
replacement, avoids spikes in the tax rate, avoids spikes in um, the expenditure for police cruisers, and, and keeps the, um, the process moving forward. And uh, there was some question as to um, whether the town uses fully electric vehicles. Uh, no, the town does not for uh, the public safety. Uh, we have some um, hybrid cruisers, but uh, we don't use the uh, fully electric vehicles at this time. They're just not practical for law enforcement. Um, so that's Article 15, and it, it includes uh, the three four-year payment program, 25 to 28 at 111000 per year, and um, that's for cruisers. Similarly, we get into Article 16 is the fire department capital expenses. And um, we have a replacement of an ambulance there and some fire gear and equipment, plus the, it says payment to stabilization, that's repaying for a loan from the stabilization fund to purchase um, another vehicle in previous years. So uh, total of fire department capital, 650000 for the upcoming fiscal year. And as indicated, Article 17 is the omnibus general government capital um, that supports the various town departments, and it is a combination of raise and appropriate through a previous override for road improvement uh, that has been authorized in um, the amount of one million one hundred thousand, and with the remainder of three million appropriated from free cash for the series of per purposes that's listed in the article. Um, and there's 35 independent projects totaling with the 1.1 million plus the 3 million, a total of 4.172 million dollars um, for capital improvements for the general operations of the town. And so we'll be going through um, each one of those projects um, through a list and folks can ask any questions on, on any of the projects that are included there. There were um, some inquiries that came in by email where people were asking what happened to the free cash article, remember? Correct. And, and this is the article. That's, that's the article. And if they look at just below where it says various departments, it says source colon free cash. Correct. I, I think they missed that line that caused them to be asking where that free cash article was because they just saw these amounts being funded. And um, so, I, you know, I point out to those folks that were concerned about that, that what they referred to as a free cash article is Article 17. Correct. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, the entire CIP is online under the Capital Improvement Program Committee. And uh, there is a portal that they can get into to look at each of the projects that are in the table with the narrative and everything else, photographs and background. So with the end of Article 17, that really wraps up the total budget uh, between the operating budget and we did first, then we moved and did all of the capital items, kept those together. Then we move into the section of the town meeting warrant that deals with some of the miscellaneous funding categories that don't fall directly under the budget or capital. And it starts with Article 18, which is for collective bargaining wage adjustments in the amount of 275000 for there are a couple of um, contracts with some of the larger collective bargaining associations that are under negotiation. And uh, we separate some funds to be able to uh, handle the wage adjustments for those collective bargaining settlements, which subsequent to um, this would fold into the operating budget in subsequent years. Um, but It talks about salary and wage. It doesn't talk about any be the benefits are not included in that, correct? Correct. So if we pay an increase in our insurance contribution, that's not reflected in that article? Correct. That would be in the... Um, in the, in the health insurance budget. This is for the wage adjustments. 
And then we move into Article 19, which we've also separated out from the <coughs> annual town budget because it's a specialty cost for the Mattakees building maintenance costs. While we continue the study program for the next year, uh, there will be, uh, we forecast an additional $200,000 in maintenance costs to um, operate that building uh, and, and continue to um, take care of it so that it, it doesn't um, deteriorate in its condition. So um, that's Article 19, Mattakee's building maintenance costs. Then we move into Article 20, which is for a compensation and classification review, which um, is a review of the town's overall wage system to ensure that the wages that we offer are competitive in our uh, labor market environment. And I would hasten to point out is that this is the type of study that should be done every seven years or so. And I, I think it's been far over 10 years since Yarmouth has, has done such a study. So it is very timely especially given all of the changes in our uh, general economy uh, and the, the lack of uh, an update for this program in order to ensure that the wages remain competitive. Uh, I, I think it's an important uh, review to make. And we have experienced a tremendous amount of problems, especially, I would say, in the ranks of our you know, most professional and technical employees where you see so many people jammed against the top of the wage grades that, that no longer get step increases. It's a warning sign and um, that's something that, that should be addressed. So Article 20 is the Compensation and Classification Review, which a professional consultant that does this work is hired. Uh, the estimated cost of the study is $30,000, and um, then we would review the results, factor those into our overall collective bargaining piece. That's Article 20, and continuing with our miscellaneous articles, we get to Article 21, which is the vote on the proposed new town seal. And um, I would acknowledge Mr. Slim, I see in the audience, the chairman of the town seal committee, or, or vice chairman. Member. Member. Thank you for attending. Trying not to slight you there. I know you work so hard. Bob Lawton's on Zoom, too. Bob Lawton's on Zoom. Now, now there's the chairman of the Town Seal Committee. Mr. Lawton, good evening. Thank you for joining us. And um, I don't know if you have any, any uh, um, questions or anything on the Town Seal. Uh, it'll be the time to discuss that town meeting in detail. Um, although Welcome back. To anybody that has questions at the end of this for any article, great, including that one. And I, I would ask maybe, if, since Mr. Slim is here, if if I did not have information, I knew a town seal would be up, and I wanted to get information. Th that's posted on the town's website. People can seek information, see the imagery, see some of the slides that have been discussed. Absolutely. So, um, any folks in the public that have questions. Please start with the, the town's website, and we'll have a great deal of information to present at town meeting as well. And um, Article 22 is, uh, we mentioned the wastewater financing prefunding program earlier when we did um, the wastewater enterprise budget. Article 22 is um, this year's wastewater financing prefunding. And what essentially we're doing is taking $2 million from free cash and $1 million, which we had already done pre-funding with and placed uh, in the wastewater enterprise and taking the total of that $3 million and placing it in the wastewater stabilization fund. And, and I would say something very interesting. By moving the $1 million out of the enterprise fund and into the stabilization fund, that enables us, as we don't need that money um, for at least four or five years. It enables us to invest it more wisely than the, um, the enterprise fund is handled just like cash, where it, you're not allowed to uh, invest it to gain a return. It just sits there so it's available. But by transferring the funds into our stabilization, stabilization fund, 
we're able to make investments that are very prudent, low-risk investments, but carry some significant interest with them. And, and like CDs, stuff like that? Yes, CDs, bonds. bond funds, um, that type. And, and, I, and I would um, acknowledge our um, new finance director, Jen Mullen, who um, came up with that strategy, which I, I think was excellent, is, is that, look, when, when we do this pre-funding, we need to put it in the stabilization fund, and then you'll start to see interest accrue directly to that fund, um, as opposed to just to the general fund. So, nice. so that's um, $3 million for the wastewater um, pre-financing. And again, we have a goal that when we start this project, we're going to have $10 million pre-funded, and that's part of the financing program uh, because in the first couple of years of operation, we won't have full flow, so we won't be con collecting the full revenue, but over a three, four-year period of using small amounts of that $10 million, we'll ramp up into our full uh, collection of, of revenues. So it's another uh, sort of belt and suspenders kind of guardrails for the uh, wastewater financing program that folks should feel feel good about that pre-funding is a wise move. Um, and then uh, to continue on the wastewater, uh, Article 23 is an adoption of Mass General Laws Chapter 80 and 83, which gives uh, the selectmen the specific authority to lay out the sewer sidewalks and drains um, and, and that also incorporates the authority to assess um, the betterments, which is a small but important part of the overall financing structure. So it's a, the acceptance of the local statutes that governs the wastewater system construction and assessment. And then uh, the details of that you see come in Article 24 is the establishment of a Yarmouth sewerage bylaw which provides the authority and definitions of creating a sewer district, of um, assessing sewer uh, betterments, what the district map is, and how the, um, the process works. And, and again, it, it just continues to authorize the Board of Selectmen to carry out uh, the provisions of the Municipal Act, but provides all of the details so it's laid right out for you. Um, and have more discussion uh, of that. Then we get to um, Article 25 and 26, again, two twin articles, uh, and they are with respect to the police department's generator, which was over 20 years old um, and had a catastrophic failure. And um, the first Article 25 transfers the sum of 300000 from funds left over in the capital project to replace the HVAC at the police station. So no new money here. And devotes those funds to replacing the generator. And in the meantime, while that generator has to be ordered and then installed, while that's being ordered and installed, uh, the, the town has to have uh, a temporary rented generator to keep the operations of the department um, rolling forward, it's uh, we can't risk having no power at the police station that could impact communications and um, you know many other life safety issues for law enforcement. What do they have at the current time for a generator? Anything? Yes, it is the rented generator that they've been carrying. But in order, this this increases the time frame. We'll be able to afford this, this is payments to pay for what's there now. Yes, the fifty. Yes. So um, we've got... Is that like a one-year lease or something? No, the, the, the lease is... Um, maybe we've got Chief here. Can you help us, um, Chief Lennon, on the time frame that the, the lease we anticipate? And a follow-up, Chief. Uh, when do we anticipate you know, getting a permanent solution to that? Uh, after we get the funding at town meeting. So what we did was we, uh, we worked with a company, uh, BLW, they put together a plan for us, and they did a study on the uh, the need, the power needs at the station. So, what the generator uh, we're going to need, uh, that came in at a, a little over two hundred thousand dollars. After town meeting, we can go through the process of procuring the generator, which is going to take about thirty to forty weeks. That's why we need the additional money. 
So right now the generator that is in place costs us about $1,800 a week. It's a 255 kW generator which will run the entire department in the event of a, uh, of a power failure. So if we need it, how, how long, how, how far out does this $50,000 payment extend? Keeps us in, the, in, a, in a temporary situation for how long? I'd have to do the math, but hopefully until we get the new generator. It's about, they said I think the outset would be about 40 weeks to get the new generator once it ordered. But hopefully hopefully sooner, because we're going to hopefully work. The with plans the are department. as soon as we get the appropriation to get right on it and correct. get the permanent fix. That is correct. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Then we move into Article 27, which is the Tourism Revenue Preservation Fund, which again is broken down by their key uh, focus areas. And um, I would also encourage folks, we have uh, the committee that oversees the Tourism Fund will be making a presentation to the Board of Selectmen at your next meeting, um, from which to, to base a recommendation at town meeting on Article 27. Uh, but that total appropriation in the Revenue Preservation Fund is 548925 and that is a calculated portion under our special act of a portion of the rooms tax receipts. So portion of the rooms tax receipts is automatically set aside for tourism that um, is devoted to Article 27. And um, another key demarcation point in the warrant is uh, once we get through Article 27, we shift into um, the Community Preservation Act funding as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee. And there are a series of one, two, three, four, five articles, all associated with community preservation. And the first is Article 28, which is the estimated revenue, um, which sets aside the statutorily determined percentages of the revenue that we collect for specific purposes, um, such as 10% is set aside for community housing, 10% is set aside for historic preservation, 10% is set aside for open space, and then 5% is set aside for administration and, and that just um, creates those reserves and then we move into the specific those actual areas through article 29 is the community preservation act affordable housing projects which is a subsidy of the yarmouth affordable housing trust in the amount of two hundred thousand to preserve and support affordable housing development here in town then article 30 is the Community Preservation Act Historic Resource Projects. And in that category, we have one project for 45000 to replace the cottage roof at the Taylor Bray Farm. And the next article is Article 31, which is the Open Space and Recreation Projects. And there's three projects there, totaling 452500 um, the first is a Phragmites management. Interestingly enough, under the open space recreation plan we reviewed this evening, that's a, a component of that, um, as well as the town ways to water, um, which is 198000 to um, identify and research and study and improve the ways to water. And then we also have 217500 to get the run pond. It's also called Kroll Pond. Um, restoration project that um, beautiful waterway with an undersized culvert that has been planned for so long We're hoping to um, make that project a reality and um, restore that wetland habitat Bob do you want to explain um, for the folks so they're not or they don't have questions about the town meeting why these um, funds are designated as quote undesignated reserves the um, designated reserves we covered in, in in the first article now now remember there were the, um, the three or four categories that each has a minimum assessment of 10% of the total but that only adds up 
to a small portion of the total funds. So the town has the authority beyond the 10%, the so we've got um, housing, historic, open space, that's only 30% of the funding. And by utilizing some of that additional 70% um, of the funding, they're able to do on a sliding process. So it would be fair to say that undesignated means they're not required to do it, but they're opting to do it? Correct. And, and as you see, sometimes last year uh, there was a, um, a larger devotion to uh, you know, some of the open space projects. We've had larger devotion to housing projects from time to time based on the needs of the town. And, and that's really one of the key functions of the Community Preservation Commission Committee to look at uh, what's in the reserves, what the town's needs are, and to make the recommendations. So that's the undesignated reserve. It's the, the money that is not slated for one single purpose. So that wraps up the community preservation, which is always a, a, a fascinating part of the town meeting. It is really critical to have the Community Preservation Act because many of these important projects, just because of the competition for funds underneath Prop 2.5, if they weren't reserved for those special purposes, where would we find money to do historic preservation, to do open space and things of that nature and so it's it's great to have the community preservation and so then at that point now we move into the last portion of the town meeting warrant that we generally reserve for some of the improvements in the local bylaws and there's two critical bylaws that um, we're updating the the first is article 32 is our general wetlands bylaw and we've had a number of Great sessions, uh, you know, detailing the need for this, that this bylaw uh, hasn't been updated in quite some time, and, and there have been pretty significant changes in the state laws related to wetlands and the local regulation of wetlands since this bylaw was adopted. And two of the most important ones are, you know, firstly, the Rivers Act, which uh, increased the buffer zone to a, a river past what it is for a normal um, wetland that is not included in the wetlands bylaw although it's a state law that people are surprised to see when they when they file an application and and a second one is the vernal pools that have been identified in town don't fall under the wetlands bylaw although state law still protects them so by updating this bylaw and making it more um, consistent with the state laws uh, you're able to be more transparent with the local public and, and folks that may want to uh, put applications in and uh, I know that the Conservation Commission and um, Brittany DiRienzo our con conservation administrator have worked very hard on this and they have some very detailed information that they're able to present at town meeting in support of this uh, but it is an important uh, bylaw that that doesn't uh, increase the um, activities of the Conservation Commission as much as better notify the public of what these requirements are so they can uh, do a better job with the applications. And um, so the wetlands bylaw is there and the last article after the wetlands bylaw is article 33 which is a zoning article uh, related to the short term rentals and essentially what what the key item here is that it extends the sunset clause while the comprehensive plan is being completed, while the planning board analyzes uh, what future short-term rental zoning requirements would be appropriate. Um, and, and that's a project that they're working on currently. And um, this extends the, um, the date of the sunset clause through November 30, 2026. So it's just a, a short extension while the planning board continues to study the short-term rentals. I don't know if I was complete enough that I miss anything there. And um, after that, everyone gets to go home. The short 33 articles. Okay, does anybody um, have any questions? or commentary. 
How about on the screen? Is anybody up there? No. No, nobody on Zoom. Okay, how about the board? Does anybody have any questions or commentary? Mark? No. Dan? No, we've been through this several times. Yes, you have. <laughs> Targets? Just to say, Bob, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I hope, I hope, Slides. I hope people have a chance to view this because in the past, those who did have given us feedback from these types of um, dry runs, if you will, and informative sessions have said it's really helped them at town meeting, understand things, and um, it, it eliminates a lot of questions they would have otherwise at the meeting. And we don't mind debate at the meeting or questions at the meeting, but we feel that you know, the more voters are familiar with the articles, the greater the level of participation, the better it will be, and hopefully um, their votes will be uh, more considered than if they just kind of wave their hand with the crowd. So um, this is important stuff. Um, we, we're trying to do everything we can to increase voter participation at town meeting. And, you know, when you really think about it, and I've said this over and over, the real power of town government is with, is with town meeting. I mean, they say yes or no to all of these things, to the funding, to the bylaws. They are the legislative branch, and, and um, we, we make recommendations. That's all the selectmen can do. We recommend this, we recommend that. People frequently go along with those recommendations, but not always. And when they don't, I don't have any problem with that. It's the people's government, it's the people's will that should prevail. So um, I know Dan's done a lot when he was uh, the town um, moderator trying to increase um, voter participation. I've been to some of the forums he attended at the high school, trying to educate the kids, get them politically involved. Um, and, and I fully support those efforts because I, I believe in what I'm saying, that this is the people's opportunity to um, do what they feel should be the right action the town should take on each of these individual items. Um, Mark, being a government teacher, I'm sure agrees with, yeah. with all of that. He's taught government courses at the community college. Um, so this is a, our effort to try to reach voters to exercise their power and authority um, over these Warren articles. And I also will commend um, um, Bob and Bill for putting together what I consider was a very, very nice, informative, and concise slide presentation. Thank you. So I thought, I thought it went well. I, I think it is going to be beneficial. I do. Is. Um, anybody have anything else? Do you want to adjourn? I have a motion to adjourn. It's almost. Is there anything for the agenda review, Mr. Chairman, yeah. that we you need want to, to go look at? Agenda review for the next. If you have any comments on that, why don't you make them and we'll. Because I'll be getting together with Bob on the next one, only because town meeting is the intervening meeting. Um, well, I had one question on the agenda review, and it had to do with an item. So we're talking here May 7th, right? 23rd? No, I think we, we have a meeting on the 23rd. 23rd? Yeah, we do. The 23rd. We have you one more right, meeting before right, town meeting. That one. I'm sorry. Walk through. We can cross out. I'm sorry. We do have the 23rd. Say again, Bob. You're suggesting we cross that out? Yeah, that was um, we rescheduled it to tonight. The town meeting preview, that's the wall. What was rescheduled? The town annual town meeting preview that we held this evening. So we wanted to be able to, you know, make adjustments. With, so we don't need to do okay. that again on the 23rd. So let me ask, let me ask you this, then, because I, I do think, I do think it's very, very important for the voters and the residents to um, get information about town meeting in our last, and our meeting before town meeting. Um, now, if we're not going to do that, then the question in my mind is, are we going to pick up the pace on the video of this discussion? Can we, like, cut and paste the town meeting preview and just sort of make sure that that gets much more frequency on 
a government channel, just finding ways to get information out. Yeah, in addition to that, we're gonna we're gonna do that. But in addition to that, we're gonna produce some additional other videos. Walk through the articles yeah. so that we have those. And and also, um, I know conservation is doing a great video on the wetlands bylaw that takes people out in the field and shows them some great things. So there's a couple of independent ones, and and I'm gonna do one uh, another general one. And so what we thought that using the communication team. Um, as we got closer, we would continue to increase the frequency between this meeting and some of the other meetings and information that goes out. Yeah, so no, because I think that's incredibly out. important. One of the reasons why we would always do um, uh, a, a meeting, you know, you spend a significant amount of time before town meeting talking about the articles is just, it's, that's generally the time people start to focus in on it. So if we can pick up the pace in terms of the video coverage, um, I think I think that that's a huge help in overcome whatever we might lose on that. Um, I noticed also on the uh, the expression of interest, the I don't know what that's all about. The expression of interest submittal to the states regarding the underutilized building program. Did we? Yes. Did I miss that? Did we no, no, that just came in, and we said, okay, when can it go on? It it, it you know, couldn't it was too late to go on for. But what? Uh, but what? But what, what is, it is it? It is it, a specific project. What, I mean to it, interrupt you. I could. No, I'm just asking you what it is. I, I'm just. I don't know what it is. Okay. So what it is is that the um, the folks that are renting the MacArthur building um, want to do continued improvements to that building, which I think are good investments. Um, make sure the heating system is. Um, are we talking about Bridgewater State, or are we talking about the collaborative? This is this would be the collaborative. Mm -hmm. So the collaborative is the sub lessee from Bridgewater State is the lessee, and the collaborative has the sublease, and and they're using the and and they have spent a lot of money, um, you know. So that's still going forward. That that's moving forward, and they have in addition to all of the funds they've already spent, and we've seen the building. I mean, it's fabulous what's been done over there. Um, they have some additional improvements that they would like to make, and they've identified um, this underutilized building program that they feel that they're eligible to receive funding to directly pour into that building. Um, and in order to do that, they would need to come in and see the Board of Selectmen. And so that was a proposal that, that they submitted. We have some detail on it. Uh, we'd like to show it to the Board of Select and give a presentation and, and s essentially see how you feel about it. So they're just looking to renovate the building? They're not looking to do any additional programming? No. They, they have very um, high level of programming. Their programming is, uh, you know, fairly robust. But so what does the Waypoint Academy mean? What does that mean? That, that? Is, is something that they're calling their collaborative programming. That's, that's a new thing. It's the first time I've heard of their Waypoint Academy. I, I think it's a, a way of describing their services, branding type of a thing. But it's but you, you're talking about the collaborative working under Bridgewater State to invest in the building to operate their special. Yeah, I just it just program. looks looked odd. Waypoint Academy. I'd never heard anything about a new Waypoint Academy. That's they, they do a tremendous amount of work over there. Karen, I don't know if you recall, but Karen and I met them. Um, a year or so ago, and we toured the place. The only problem they were having, they were having some water infiltration near one of the doorways. I don't know if they ever resolved that. But but it's unbelievable the amount of work that they've done. Probably millions of dollars worth of work. Mr. Chairman, I know people are hanging around here. I don't think that we're not, I, I don't think we're going to, I think you folks are free to no. go. <laughs> yeah, thanks for hanging in there, but... We're, Here, do you know that waypoint? Oh, that, Jeff. It, it, Look at Jeff is hanging out in the corner there. Yeah. It's in no, go home. Go home. We promise not to say anything about you or do anything. All right. So you're free to go. Is that okay, Thanks Mr. For Chairman? In there, you guys. So that's okay. Thanks for clarifying that, Bob. I thought there was some new initiative or something that they were doing. They're just going after more funds to renovate the building. Okay, that's great. So we can delete the uh, town meeting walkthrough from the... Uh, 
Here's another question. I know the um, on there is the discussion presentation of the regional dispatch. I know there's been a lot of press, there's a lot of media. Um, I just want to just float the idea with, with the board changing in the election. Um, does it make sense to put off that discussion until the new the election and the new board comes in? Because it's a pretty significant sure. item for discussion. I just wanted to sort of float that. I'm not making the recommendation. I'm just asking the, the question. May 16th? May 15th? May 16th? May 21st. Is it the 21st? Yeah. I believe so. So it's coming up. Is that the election? Yeah. Hi. 21. Right, so it's it's about six weeks away. A21. The only problem is that um, the state has a grant program. So it's time sensitive? So it's time sensitive. Okay, then go forward and make the presentation. I, uh, candidly, I, I was a little caught up by this too. I, di I didn't remember that we had had these types of um, discussions. No. So, yeah, I'd love to hear this and see what see where we're going. Yeah, I just don't want it to be a surprise. I may not vote at all for an agreement, period, because I think with an election coming and a new board being seated, yeah, it, it, it may not be appropriate. So I, I, I need to know more, but um, I'm, I may not be prepared to vote at all for that. So what has to be done to implement this agreement is it is it simply a simple majority of the board bob yes it's an intermunicipal agreement just agreement between the towns so each select board and in barnstable well shouldn't we at least get a presentation on this as to where i mean regardless of a vote shouldn't we get i'm happy to get yeah a briefing on it, but I'm just—I don't want there to be a surprise because, uh, like I said, we're, it's, it's getting at a point where it's close to an election, and it's a pretty significant development. And uh, um, it's just a concern that I have. I know I'm, I'm trying to separate the action on it versus an update. Well, it just means that we're going to, from my point of view, if if we don't take action until after the board, then why? Plus, the time sensitivity is based upon action, I think, right? When do you have to, when, when does a decision have to be made? Let's put it that way for your... Work backwards? For, yeah, for the, you're talking about um, time sensitive, so... Yeah, well, I think that the, uh, the grant has to go in sometime in, in May, by the end of May or something. Okay, so... It'd be a good idea to um, present it out there and, and just get everybody caught up to speed on it, whether you vote or not. It's... I, I think it's a it's a good enough issue. That I, I agree with that, but I think we I think certainly we could hold the vote if you're not comfortable with the vote. That's fine. Okay. I'd also suggest that we can but always like to, invite like to find out what's in there, what's going what on, the what's current all about. status right. is, you know, the ins and outs, so to speak. And if we want to hold it until we get two newly elected members, we'll do that. But I'd also suggest we send out an invitation to uh, the candidates. To remind them that they, this would be a good meeting for them to all attend to get yeah, some information. Right. How do you feel about the intermunicipal agreement? I wonder if they will have a candidate's night. They haven't, they haven't had one in quite a while. They haven't. There was a request was made. Very to, unfortunate. It is. Maybe in the future, maybe the moderator could take take that on or something. Uh, actually, well, it would be a great really idea. Kind of start with COVID and all that. That yes, yeah, fell apart then. Yeah. That's a great idea. It really. was a good. It was a good. Uh, the papers used to send out questionnaires too. Yep. I always enjoyed participating in that. Yep, absolutely. All right, so we'll leave that on the agenda, Bob. But understand that we may not have a vote that night. Um, I got to check with uh, Sergeant Hennessy. He was going to be talking to these folks at Music Room to see if there would be a possible resolution. I, I've got to give him a call, see what that looks like. If it's not, we're going to have to have a hearing, and I got to believe 
the hearing could be protracted. I hope not, but there's a resolution. As Dan said, it, whatever they propose would have to be subject to your approval. Um, I'm deliberately staying out of it in case there's a hearing. Mm -hmm. I know. Right. Stay objective about this. So I just kind of call him and check in and say, hey, what does it look like? I would suggest that we just leave a little spot on the agenda of potentially for wastewater. You know, it, just that we have some time set aside for that if something should come up. That, that to me, <laughs> like okay, wastewater is kind of a fluid thing right now. I agree, I agree with you, but we could also, if we had to, address that under town administrator updates. So, right. you know, we can do that any time really either way. But you're right, I agree with you that it's critically important. Especially with these so, looming deadlines. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, okay, anything else? Mr. Chairman, can I make a comment? Can you do what? Can I make a comment? She'd want to make a comment earlier. What do you want to comment on? Well, and I'm sorry, but is the meeting still, still going? Or when you said adjourned, is, has it been adjourned? I'm sorry. Why don't you come up and uh, speak in the microphone? I can't hear you well. Okay. Put, go yeah, the we're still on. Um, so I just wanted to quickly apologize for having to leave before. Um, I was, I, I did have, I do have young children that I had to get to bed, and it's 10 o'clock. Oh, you don't have to explain your. Yeah. But no. I apologize for, it was my intention to be here when we circled back to the agenda item so that I could appropriately make a comment. Um, and I was driving home listening to the meeting and attempted to raise my hand once you got to that agenda item because sure enough it was oh, two minutes know, after sorry, leaving here. So I took a screenshot of it and I was going to email you and copy everyone on and say, hey, I'm so sorry I just had to leave, but it was a critical time for me as a mother to be home and my household. Needless to say, all of that's a moot point. I just wanted to make sure that I commented on um, the vagueness of the proposed question for the ballot um, was actually quite intentional. Um, and just making sure that it's obvious what I'm talking about, the idea of a pool or a community aquatics facility. Um, it was really intentional for it to be so vague. Um, anything regarding the location the funding, the costs, what the engineering of any building might look like, the timing of it, all of those things would be covered in a feasibility study that our group is privately funding. Um, so again, just to reiterate what I, I don't think that I eloquently was able to share from the podium earlier, the intention of this proposed ballot question was simply to allow us as the town of Yarmouth to perhaps be a leader and just pointing for the rest of the community to say yeah let's see let's see what what is the interest and i absolutely agree with with what mr smith said and what others feedback in hindsight the question could have been more comprehensive or could have been written perhaps a little bit more detailed than it was to say something like with costs to be undetermined or you know with costs not yet determined with location not yet determined with funding being private including all of those things in the question however i wasn't able to have that feedback from you all as a select board to help better point the question um, I'm old enough to know that that life um, is is all about timing. So perhaps this just isn't the right timing to get it on this calendar years. I think part of it's timing, but I think the other part of it really is detail. I mean, people have to know what they're voting for. And if they, I've been doing this a long time. I've been a selectman for like 11 years. And before that, I've been a town meeting member for probably 40 years. If people don't know and don't have a good sense of what they're voting for, they're going to vote no. I I will bet you I will bet you a hundred bucks. 
we've never had an art, a question like this put on our ballot. Something like this in this vague. And, and the Generally, other thing, Carolyn, is, is yes. the, voters, the voters don't even know who you are, mo most of the people right. that are voting. So if there's questions, or there's Plus, ambiguities, or there's criticism of why did you put something like this on, right. it's not going to come your way. It's going to come to our staff. Well, I understand that, and that feedback also was understood. Again, I think had we started this, had I started this conversation with you two months ago, and with all respect, I emailed you asking, could I have this front, this face-to-face -face conversation with the select board to get some feedback to uh, better after point the, the question? agenda was posted. No, this was in the in the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. So I, I did want to point this question better than, than it is I written. I pointed to you the process you should go through before you come to the Board of Selectmen and go through groups like recreation and get recommendations and support for people like that. You are not going to, I don't care what project it is, you're not going to, let's take a rec building, for example, something I tried to do when I was on the rec commission. You don't just walk into the Board of Selectmen and say, I'd like to get a rec center. You go through the people that would have jurisdiction over that, like recreation. You would you would talk about location. You would talk about funding sources. We get these things when they got a lot more meat and form to them. We don't we don't go out and do this because we don't have the time to do it. That's why we have a lot of committees and commissions and agencies that are working on these kinds of things, just like Madikis. We're not going to go out and try to develop the Mattachy site. We're going to form a committee that's going to study that site with consultants. And as these ideas materialize in gel, and as community support is gained, that's pretty much when they start coming before us. The difference would be all of what you just mentioned sounds like it's a municipal funded facility. If we're looking to fund this privately and with federal grant money, in fact, we even have we a got to get a site too. Correct. But then why would you have it on a municipal ballot? That's a, a relevant question. Right. And, and that's where I am pushing you as leaders of our community. But here's, here's the deal, all right? If you're doing a private facility, this has nothing to do with the municipal government. Why would we even put it on a municipal ballot? Fair enough, because you might care about no, but the point. No, but the point is, is you might want to do a poll if that's what you're looking for. How do you do a poll? Survey a monkey. You, you do a survey. So we've done, we have 200 respondents. Then why, then why do you need to use our ballot as a poll? Because I want 20,000 respondents. But then you would do a poll that goes to 20,000 people. You hire a pollster to do that. Okay. That's what other groups do. That's what we're, we're looking to do that. And in the meantime, we just thought we would follow suit with perhaps what Chatham and Harwich and other towns on the Cape are doing. They have done ballot questions just like this? They have it on the warrant in Harwich, and they're looking to put it on the ballot in Chatham. And I didn't want my town, our town, to lose, to lose this project. No, I understand. It's just it's a very unorthodox approach. It's something, like I said, we've never done anything like this here in Yarmouth. And if you want to gauge a survey of 20,000 residents in a community, most groups, private groups, do polls. That's they hire someone to do a survey and find that out. That's what we're looking to find. Yeah. And in the meantime, you generally I don't do it on a municipal ballot. Okay. okay, let's stay orthodox. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move that we adjourn. You also move the question. <laughs> move the question now. Opposed in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>